Um, welcome to this Essential Shifts event. My name is Gillian Wishart and I'm a lecturer in architecture at the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture and Built Environment, part of Robert Gordon University. Uh, I'm a stage one studio leader and teach environment and services to second year. Uh, and I'm part of a trio that's put the event together. Um, myself and hand over to Cathy or Andy. Uh, hi, my name's Cathy Lee. Um, I'm an architect, uh, but I've actually been in teaching for 20 years in Scotland. Um, and I run year one at the MAC here. Um, and my involvement in this event came out of connections with a Scottish Educators Forum, um, wanting to know a bit more about how schools are promoting and dealing with climate change, environmental and ecological emergencies. I'm also part of Missing in Architecture. Um, it's a collaboration of educators at the MAC. So we're trying to sort of fill in the gaps in our, in our um, teaching and our curriculum. Um, so we do things, issues of things that are not necessarily building related, but raising equality, diversity, social and environmental issues. So that's me and Andy, about you. Hi everybody, good morning. My name is Andy Summers. Um, I have all three of my hats on today in terms of uh, I am the co-pilot at stage four at the Glasgow School of Art here. Um, I'm also teaching at Edinburgh University. I have done for eight years in second year and I also help with logistics and professional practice there. And I'm a co-founder and co-director of the Architecture Fringe, which is a volunteer-led organisation based in Scotland, uh, which explores architecture in our social, political and cultural context. So uh, we've had a really great time, uh, the three of us working together. We thank you all for being here. Good. Thank you very much. Um, so the event was born really as a consequence of recognising that architectural teaching staff are all grappling with how to integrate a response to the climate and ecological emergency in their teaching in a meaningful and appropriate way. So what is appropriate when we're in an emergency that is unfolding around the world and ever more closer to home? When emissions targets are set and consistently missed and when we know we're experiencing the sixth mass extinction? What's appropriate when we know that the construction industry accounts for 40% of carbon emissions, the most carbon being emitted as a result of the construction of a building, and we've less than 10 years for any response to have an impact. What is appropriate when architecture is so much more than simply a response to the climate and ecolo ecological emergency, when it must continue to aspire to be beautiful? Architecture is part of a continuum of cultural and societal evolution and reflects and represents the belief systems of a society. What, therefore, is appropriate content and delivery for architecture courses in the eye of the climate storm? I would argue that architectural education is now not that different compared to 20 years ago. And how different should it be? After all, the nature of being human, of living, loving, celebrating, caring has not changed, and our role as architects to design the stage for lives to be lived has not changed. However, the sands beneath that stage are shifting rapidly and there's now a new imperative. And if we think of the climate and ecological emergency as a new member at the dinner table, a new contributor to the discussion, I think we're all trying to figure out a way to allow this voice to be heard loud and clear, but not to the exclusion of other less quantifiable, but no less important voices. If architecture is to remain an artistic as well as a social pursuit, it's a balancing act where the stakes are high. So what we're interested to explore here today as a body of staff and students is how our schools, our courses, our curriculum and our pedagogy might weave this new imperative into the collective understanding, perception, judgments and ultimately our design responses, whether that be the design of courses, of project briefs or a piece of architecture. So we're delighted to be joined by our keynote speakers, Sophie Pelsmaker, Essie Nissenen and Felicity Atekpe, and a wonderful lineup of presenters, each of whom will be properly introduced at the start of the sessions. We have three sessions this morning. The first is looking at the bigger picture, the wider responses at institutional and course level. The second is kind of zooming in and looking at responses at studio level. And the third session is an idea sprint, sort of quick fire expose of some projects from around the Scottish schools of architecture. And we hope that the, these three sessions and the ensuing discussions will provide rich food for thought and action in the coming academic session. And we'd encourage you all to get involved in the discussions after each session, after the first two sessions. Um, please place your comments and questions in the chat here and also on our Miro board, which Cathy will introduce. And the event will be recorded and the link sent out to everyone in due course. Um, Essential Shifts has been funded by the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture and Built Environment 
part of Robert Gordon University. So over to Cathy, thanks. Okay, so um, like uh, all us people who've been involved in education and um, post pandemic, we're used to use the, the Zoom um, function in the chat, uh, chat function, sorry, and um, we're probably all used to using uh, Miro, but I'm gonna share our Miro board. I've put a link in the chat and hopefully we can start seeing what's uh, how this is set up. So this is just for anybody, if you want to add to this, you can use the Zoom um, chat function if you want. You can put your hand up if you want in Zoom, if you want to uh, add any questions or comments. But essentially, if I take you through the uh, Miro board, um, we have our event timetable here. So uh, Gillian's just run through that. But if you want to keep a check on things, you want to just check who, who's speaking and when, you can have a look at the event timetable down on the left hand side. We've got uh, biographies of our key speakers. And then this is the key thing for all our attendees. If you want to, per session, make some comments, that would be absolutely fab. Um, you know, if you've got some key takeaways from the, our three main speakers, and then if you've got any questions or comments, you can put place them here or in Zoom chat. Um, and session two is set up exactly the same way. And it allows us to record what's been said, um, any comments from all our participants and um, uh, attendees. And then our final session for the ideas sprint. Um, I think this is a good one. It's just a snapshot of, of things that are happening in Scotland. But if anybody has their own ideas and experiences they want to add to our uh, Miro board, that would be absolutely fab for you to do that as well. So that's our Miro board. Um, and if people want, if you haven't used Miro before, you just come in a, a, a link through the link and then you can pick up a post-it note or zoom in on that. And then you can type anything you want. <laughs> I'll do a blah, blah in there. All right, so it's a fairly easy thing to do with a mouse um, if you haven't used Miro before. Okay, that's me on Miro. Okay, and just to uh, double uh, chat about uh, Zoom here, um, so yeah, as uh, Gillian and Kathy said, if you have any comments as we go through, please feel free to post them into the chat. If you'd like to verbally uh, reply or contribute, please just put your hand up uh, with the Zoom function if you can, uh, and I will come to you. Um, but yes, uh, thanks again for joining us. I uh, appreciate if you have your cameras on. If you don't, that's also totally fine. Um, but uh, I'll hand back to Kathy, I think, who's going to introduce session one. Okay, all right. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Gillian. Um, so session one, um, as Gillian was saying, we're really looking at the macro level um, for the essential shifts. Uh, we're looking at the school shifts and maybe institutional level or even also wider societal and global levels. Um, we have our three speakers, Sophie, uh, Essie and David. Um, they are going to present consecutively um, and then we'll open up for a discussion afterwards. Uh, if you haven't, <laughs> I'm going to introduce our guests very briefly. You can read the bios on the, on the Miro board. But if you don't know who Sophie is, and everybody should know who <laughs> Sophie is, um, Sophie is an environmental architect and educator and researcher at Tampere School of Architecture in Finland. Um, if you haven't got these books on your reading list, you should do it. If you haven't read them, you should do. So she's the author of the Environmental Design Pocketbook and Essential for All Students. Uh, and young architects. Um, she's a co-author of Design for Climate Emergency. Um, that's a guide for architect students and, of, and of energy and people and buildings. And um, she's also uh, the co-guest editor of a really important book called Everything Needs to Change. And we did actually go through <laughs> our, our titles for the um, symposium. And we were gonna say every course needs to change, but we ended up with the essential shifts, but that was a driver really for for having these discussions. Um, Essie Nissanen is a freshly graduated architect and a creative currently teaching and researching sustainable housing design. Um, and her passion is to explore and discover paths for transformational learning beyond the status quo. David Villa Domini, who I understand is informally known as DVD. That's the only way I really remember it. <laughs> um, he studied architecture in Bath, Barcelona and Edinburgh and has combined teaching and practice and he's currently course leader in architecture at the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture, which is RGU, Robert Gordon University, 
where he teaches design in the Masters History and Theory in the, and in part one. Um, and he is also a certified passive house designer. Uh, so um, I think the talks are gonna be um, about uh, changing um, shifts. And if without further ado, I think what we'll do is we'll um, ask Felicity, uh, and no, we'll ask um, Sophie to start first of all. Um, if you can share your screen, Sophie, that would be great. I think you can see this now and you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Fabulous. And uh, Kathy, you made me blush with that introduction. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to give only a very brief 10 to 12 minute talk and then Essie will follow on straight away. Um, and it's really just an introduction and some thoughts that I've recently been having um, uh, with colleagues as well. So I just wanted to set the scene about architecture and the capitalist scene and the ugliness of unsustainability and what that means for us uh, in architecture and in education. Uh, Kathy already did a comprehensive introduction, but so I'm originally from Belgium and I trained there my bachelor's and then the rest in the UK. And I've dedicated the past 20 years to sustainable architecture, studying, teaching, researching, and practicing it. I bring experience from the UK and also from Denmark, and I'm now associate professor in sustainable housing design here in Finland. And I lead a research group called Asutut, a sustainable housing design research and teaching group. And we also have um, uh, research into education and pedagogy, so we can bring our research into the classroom, use it as a test bed. Um, and uh, yeah, and so really about methods for teaching sustainable architecture. There you can see some of my publications and. Um, a one that is co-authored with colleagues at Sheffield University and in Denmark uh, is out, literally the print press now, and should be out this or next week in the warehouse. And uh, some of the work uh, we're referring to um, is featuring in that. Just to let you know where we're based, um, this is Tampere, uh, city of Tampere, sec second biggest city in Finland, um, and about two hours north uh, from Helsinki, the capital. So I'm just going to kick off immediately the climate crisis. So in August 2021, and just uh, a month ago, um, the IPCC released their sixth report, and they issued what's called the Code Red. The Code Red, because climate change is widespread, it's rapid, intensifying, and in our lifetime, some of the trends that are happening are irreversible, uh, particularly ice melting and sea level rises. Things are also happening a lot faster than the models have been predicting. But the message was also very clear that there's still time to limit further climate change and at that time is now. The latest report uh, that came out in April is actually almost 3000 pages long, but the recommendations for the built environment for architecture and planning are about 60 pages. And I'll try to do a summary in the next month of that as well. So it's, it's a bit more manageable and very clear uh, points of action. So how did we get to this code red? Well, and I'm massively simplifying because I'm only speaking a very short time, so my apologies for that, um, for making a complex issue seem very simple. But I think it's important that we sort of set the scene and that we um, really understand that how we got here can actually be traced back to the capitalist scene. And the capitalist scene is really the suppression and domination of humans, their cultures, but also non-humans and nature, and all to maximize profit. And that exploitation actually goes back to the colonization of other countries and the subjugation of people and the extraction of their resources. Now, of course, this exploitation was and still is being done by a minority, by some humans. Usually they're wealthy, white, and a lot of the time they've been men, and they continue to exploit the planet and other people, and the other people and the planet then face the consequences of this. And that has then created these deep injustices, environmental degradation and toxification of land, water and air. And that's now destabilizing the planet simply because we've been doing this for such a long time and at a significant scale across the globe as well. And it's really ingrained in everything we do. So it's not just about engineering our way out and technological fix fixes, but we need societal changes. And I've come to refer to it as from exploitative to restorative practices. Um, what I'll do when the next speaker talks, I'll put some of these links for further reading into the uh, either on the Myra board uh, or in the chat as well. So what does the capitalist scene and all of this extracting uh, and, and exploitation have to do with architecture? Well, 
architecture has actually spatialized and legitimized these exploitative practices. If you think about it, who pays for most of the architecture? Well, actually, the sources of money are actually enabling this exploitation and pay for it. Um, we also tend to then focus on the needs and wishes of the privileged few who pay for the architecture we create. And then, of course, the obvious one, the extraction of resources and exploitation of people in the process of creating architecture is a significant part. So architecture was clearly made possible through this exploitation and extraction. And its aesthetics was only made possible through this very same exploitation and extraction. That's why I refer to it as exploitative aesthetics. And these aesthetic values that we still hold today are actually based on this exploitation, but also on this outdated view from the very few in society going back to the early 20th century, if not even earlier. But we cannot create sustainable non-exploitative architecture that's based on these exploitative aesthetics. So aesthetics, beauty, ugliness, what all of this means. Again, I'm really simplifying the discussion. There's a whole field that will act that and philosophy as well that looks at the meaning of aesthetics and, and this tradition. But if you think about it, aesthetics is really about the appreciation of beauty and delight. And in architecture, a lot of the time, or most of the time, we've really taken that about pleasing the senses or the mind aesthetically. So it's a visual experience that we focus on in architecture. And ugly then means that being unattractive, architecture repulsive, especially in the appearance of it. And I want to question that, because if you actually look at the definition of beauty outside architecture, it also means being of a very high standard. Ugly means horrible, awful, unpleasant. It also means shocking and morally unacceptable. So I want to create a new definition uh, of architecture and aesthetics um, and how we then look at sustainable architecture and what we're currently producing. But before I do that, I want to sort of pause a little bit with this whole notion of aesthetics and beauty and what's ugly architecture. Who decides? Well, often we think it's an objective judgment, right? We think that we decide as an individual, um, it's our own evaluation, but actually we are massively influenced in architecture by these intrinsic, these internal values and culture in our profession. It's everything we see uh, that's created in the media as well that perpetuates these intrinsic values. So we actually don't so much objectively judge the aesthetics of buildings, but we judge it really intersubjectively. We're massively influenced by it. And it comes back again that these intrinsic values uh, are dating back to 70, 100 years ago that are still influencing us today when, again, this non-diverse group of architects at the time defined what these values should be and these traditions have been living on. So that's why everything needs to change. Um, because these values, these intrinsic values are still taught, practiced and internalized by us as architects and the profession and in our teaching today. And it's how we measure our achievements as well. And so we need to go from these exploitative aesthetics to sustainable or restorative aesthetics, but that's why we need to change our values and why we need a wider definition of beauty and delight. And um, as we heard earlier in the introduction of today's event, beauty is only one component. It's not the only thing that matters, but it is still important as part of sustainable architecture. It's no time for me to go into this, but um, you know, it is one component. But we need to really move from intersubjective to more objective ways to evaluate real beauty of architecture in our changing 21st century context. So I propose a new way of looking at aesthetics, whereby beauty and ugliness are not just aesthetic characteristics of a building, not just the visual, I mean by that, but it includes all of the aspects of sustainable architecture. They have to be evaluated objectively, not intersubjectively, that can only be done by architects. And so that means a beautiful architecture has to be a very high standard and cannot be based on unethical or uh, decisions or um, processes. Um, and the same for ugly architecture. It means that then of the low standards and is morally unacceptable aspects included. So this is why I want to talk about the ugliness of unsustainable architecture. And I want to give a brief example of this, perhaps a bit controversial and provocative. Um, everybody knows about Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building. And um, when we look at it intersubjectively, it's considered a beautiful building by our profession still today. It's an iconic building that we still admire for its aesthetic. 
And of course, we have to look at it at this time. It was conceived at a time plentiful resources. It was a, um, a structural and an aesthetic kind of achievement at the time. Um, you know, there were no worries about materials where they came from, about fossil fuels, because we were not exploiting them at scale. And so all of the effects of climate change were not fully understood yet at this time. And so its aesthetic um, reflects this era as well. Uh, I just want to quickly check. I'm getting a notification at my own laptop that my internet connection is unstable. Can people hear me okay? Yes. Okay. We can still hear you, yeah. All right. Okay, let's hope. Um, it's rare that I get actual notification from my own uh, internet provider. Um, so yeah, the aesthetic reflects this era. Um, you know, it was an era of loads of glass, uh, cheap materials, uh, because fossil fuel heat was also cheap and abundant. So these were not things we were concerned about at the time. So it's a really important building of its time. But when we look at it objectively today in the 21st century, this is a bit cheeky doing this with very different kind of um, uh, standards in a way. I would say there's a lot of things ugly about it. Um, it's got large CO2 emissions from fossil fuels to operate the building, to control the indoor environment. Um, it contributes, therefore, to climate change. And those impacts are really severe because our actions affect people thousands of miles away, especially low-lying islands. And often those that contributed the least to climate change are being the most affected, which then refers back to climate justice issues. Secondly, it's one of the most expensive buildings of its, of its time. It's exclusive and excluding. People usually cannot get in. Um, they get ushered away. Um, it gives little back to the public or the community. It also really neglects users. So um, the architect decided for the aesthetic that the blinds can either be fully up, all the way down, or halfway. And that then affects thermal and visual comfort and well-being, increases energy use, which means increased um, carbon emissions as well, and again, contributes to climate change. And then materials uh, to construct this building have also traveled thousands of kilometers and they use a lot of finite resources. So it's got a large embodied carbon that contributes to the climate crisis. 47% of the embodied energy is for bronze and brass and 30% on concrete. And actually the bronze and brass is only about, I think it's less than 5% of the actual materials in the building. There were a lot of exploitative practices and ecological implications that were exported to other regions around the world affecting communities there. So it really ignores what we now know as our global ethical responsibility as architects. And I really recommend you look at Kilmo's uh, book uh, on this building who traced back actually the environmental impact of this. And what's worrying today is not so much that this has had this impact, but what is worrying is that we're still aspiring to this aesthetic and this kind of building when we're in a different world. And so similar buildings today are designed the world over and we should know better uh, today. So to tackle the climate crisis, our values and culture, this intrinsic values, right? And our intrinsic culture in our profession need to change. We cannot create truly sustainable architecture with the same exploitative, intersubjective values and culture. And you know, when we use these outdated values and priorities, it leads to unsustainable um, decisions. And I just briefly, there's no time to go into this, but in our book and also in our Art for Change project, which I'll come into it in my final summary uh, in a minute, um, we map these 10 key um, aspects of sustainable architecture that are all interconnected. And you can see here the light or beauty is one of them. And often in architecture, it's been the light and beauty that as architects, we think are the most important, but actually we need very high standards in all of these. And the light and beauty is simply one of them. So when we have new values, it should lead to a new aesthetic and a new architecture. It's no longer just good enough that we just put solar panels on a building and say we've done our job. And it's no longer enough in education that we teach our students how to calculate the solar panels. And, you know, it's really about really these different values and thinking very differently about it to begin with. For example, does that building we're creating, should it even exist to begin with? Does it actually need to be created? Does it need to be created where it is? So it's actually going back to some fundamental questions we have to begin with. Another metaphor is um, when we talk about replacing um, uh, fossil fueled cars with electric cars, 
um, yes, it's got less of an impact, but actually fundamentally the values we need to have in our society is we need to think about moving around in different ways in the city. And that's the new values and culture that I'm actually talking about. One example is the Archetype Enterprise Center. Uh, most of you know this, I think, it's Timber Frame, Lime Render, Invitech Touch Cladding, a certified passive house. They did uh, climate change modeling uh, as well to see how it might perform in the future. And they also undertake post-occupancy evaluation. And I think intersubjectively, some might, of us might think it's ugly, especially the external kind of new innovation and the way it's being designed. But actually, when you look at it objectively, it's a very high standard. There were no unethical decisions made. It includes many of these sustainability aspects as well. And this is where we, when I look at buildings with how I was trained, I might not immediately go, wow, this is beautiful when I see sustainable architecture, but when I learn more, it actually shifts my perception of how beautiful that building is. So we have to stop our current ugly, unsustainable practices because the scale of the challenge means we cannot get it wrong. The time to act is now. This graph shows you that we still, at this moment in time, can decide what global warming we're going to hit. And it's really important that we stay below this one and a half to two degrees C Celsius. So we need to really massively change where we are. The current trajectory is actually four to six degrees C Celsius. And the reason why we want to stay below two degrees, ideally one and a half, we're about away at 1.2 already, is so that the ice caps don't melt and we don't get basically um, seven meter sea level rise. But we actually only have a very short time to change and to act. And this was very much the message of the IPCC report that architecture and planning is lagging behind all other sectors in climate action. And that especially in our sector, it's so important that we act before 2030 because of this long lifespan of buildings, um, you know, and the urban and land use policies that we risk locking in emissions and polluting development and unsustainable behaviors for decades. And again, to stress that technology and engineering solutions alone will not be enough. It's not just enough to change you know, our fossil fuels to clean fuels. We need new values and be part of creating a new culture that rethinks the way we work. So it's about challenging the status quo. And I really believe that we have a collective responsibility to protect our planet and architecture. And so nothing less than radical change of our values, culture and practices is required in architecture and the rest of society to avoid this high level of warming. Because let's face it, there is no life, no architecture, and we won't care about beauty in a four degrees Celsius world because we will have much bigger problems. So just very briefly before I hand over to Essie, we have this arc for change project and I can see my colleagues from uh, TU Dublin are here, Sarah and Emma. Uh, and it's really, it's called Arc for Change. It's really about rethinking education and creating methods towards carbon neutrality. So it's an architecture curriculum and a teacher training toolkit on a digital platform. All of this is being produced basically in the next year. And it's not just uh, a curriculum, but also knowledge and tools to change our values and culture and architecture. So it's really about challenging the status quo. And of course, that must start in architecture education. The new book that we have in the print press now is really focusing on this curriculum aspect. And then Essie uh, was part funded through the project to undertake her a master's thesis called Architecture, Sustainability, Educating the Transformative Practitioner. So it's really about changing values and culture in architecture. And she really tried to unfold the starting points of how to do this in education. So I'm going to hand over to Essie now. Perfect. Thank you, Sophie. I hope you can all hear me well. I'm going to share my screen and Put it on full screen. I hope you can uh, see the slides well and hear me well. Yeah. Perfect. So, hello everybody. And uh, it's a privilege to be here today to uh, talk to you all. And um, well, I'm going to continue straight from uh, where Sophie ended her talk. And I'm going to talk a bit about on how to challenge the status quo through uh, an idea of uh, designing for democracy. So uh, briefly, really briefly about me as we were introduced before. So uh, I'm a recently graduated architect from Tampere, Finland. And I'm currently teaching and researching sustainable housing design together with Sophie. 
And I'm also especially interested in architecture education and the pedagogies of uh, transformation. And I took a deep dive into the matter through my master's thesis, Architecture of Sustainability, Educating the Transformative Practitioner. And I'm here today to share with you some insights from, let's say, my own transformational journey towards sustainability and some things and, and values that can, once seen, cannot really be um, unseen. So, as has been discussed earlier, currently we're living in an era that is characterized by an imbalance of power, where the maximization of profit is based on the suppression of communities and cultures, non-humans and nature. And as we all know, this tradition of ignorance is at the heart of the climate crisis too. We have positioned ourselves to the top of hierarchies and humans understand and explain the world around us. We unveil its logic and we control it. Nature is a complicated system that can be managed through rational planning and the use of science and technology. And there is really nothing peculiar about the fact that our education reflects these values too. We learn values and beliefs and praxis from our own life, the society around us, our education, and then we pass them on. Higher education institutions train citizens to be a part of societies and, and to work uh, through their inner logic. Currently, we're training people to deal with the status quo. We develop useful skills, we alter our actions to reach desired outcomes, and we become problem solvers. There's always something we need to react to, something to fix with a better and more innovative solution. But of course, the reason why we are here today has been born out of a somewhat alternative perspective, a much more urgent one, which on some level is related to the climate emergency, but on many other ways to something much broader. There has never been a time in history where it is enough to learn how to deal with the status quo. It has always been far more important to learn to see beyond it, as it is really the only way to move forward. And in this case, we need to learn to break out from the tradition of oppression and inequality. And in architecture education, the partially unconscious internalization of these societal values has resulted into highly undemocratic traditions in our learning cultures which really prevent the necessary transformation towards sustainable values, beliefs, and actions. And in a system, underlying goals and values and cultures uh, shape the everyday actions of individuals. And then in return, these actions influence the underlying structures. So integrating sustainability in architecture education and in the design studio calls for both tackling these underlying values and behaviors of students and teachers and delivering sustainability knowledge and concrete tools for um, actions. So in order to change our values and praxis, they need to be challenged. And in order for them to be challenged, we need to share them with others. And critical thinking, which is necessary for sustainability, is effectively developed in conversational and collaborative learning. Many know it with the name of, for example, peer-to-peer -peer learning where opportunities for shared equal reflection and meaning making are fostered and reason and emotion are inseparable from learning the atmosphere and the culture of a learning environment determines what one learns and whether one even learns at all but how often is this actually taken into account in architecture education um, we all know the star architects and the masters and the practitioner teachers who teach us and hold the valuable tacit knowledge that is passed to us through design briefs and one-to-one -one discussions, guidances, and crits. We showcase and we highlight and we prefer individual designer capabilities, and we upkeep the master apprentice model, where someone holds the knowledge and transmits it to us. And I'm not saying that this is fully wrong or somehow solely despicable, but it's just the way we do it that doesn't work. So high hierarchies and, and transmissive teaching methods promote individual capability over collaboration and external validation over self-motivation and critical thinking. And in order to create something new, alternative perspectives uh, or insights need to be discovered and brought together. And merging diverse perspectives and interpersonal and interdisciplinary uh, knowledge is achieved, achieved through interaction, never through working alone. And so at its heart, education is not something that is done transmissively to students, but with them. 
And learning is a profound human relationship that allows for both students and educators to feel recognized and valued and empowered. Contemporary research widely acknowledges the benefits of collaboration and communication <clears throat> as a means to encourage transformational behavior. Peer-to-peer -peer learning fosters the idea of sharing tacit knowledge amongst people, sharing unique and versatile perspectives, and it doesn't limit it to an exchange of knowledge between teachers and students, but sees it as a collective dialogue amongst everyone in the learning space, teachers, students, communities, policy makers policymakers, you name it. So at its core, when it comes to design, creativity shouldn't really be seen as a correct characteristic or a skill of an individual designer, but as a shared experience that motivates problem posing and problem solving. And by extension, another key discovery regarding sustainability is that an individual's ability to work cooperatively and to establish and maintain human relationships really determines their actions towards the environment. And that is why the era of high hierarchies and the preference of these individual designer capabilities must come to an end. In a democracy, all citizens have the right to participate in and feel ownership of societal values and praxis. And in the context of architecture, their shared urban environment. And this right works equally both ways. Citizens have the right to occupy urban space as well as the right to produce it so that it meets their needs. And this notion is crucial. In a democracy, individuals have the right to be involved in decision-making that affects them and the common good. And by extension, this means that architects are given the responsibility of representing other citizens and their needs rather than assuming needs and excluding some people we design for. And this is why the ways we currently ask questions in architecture, how we pose problems is also in many ways deeply flawed. Our designs are based on the idea that we assume people's needs and we often do not have the chance to understand why something is done in the first place. And we do not fully understand the starting points of our design projects or the communities, factual or fictional, human or non-human, that our interventions concern. And besides reflecting the current dominant situation in practice, where the starting point of design is a set of interpretations over users' values, usually made by someone who represents the users, not the users themselves, and where the designer rarely has any means to reinterpret those needs or even know their origins, nor establish a dialogue with the people who are directly affected by the design. The tradition of top-down problem posing is an extension of our current preference of transmissive hierarchical learning cultures. We assume that individual designers have the capability to interpret and understand the needs of diverse complex user bodies or communities without consulting their needs, as if architecture education would somehow give us the tools to play God. And in its current state, what architecture truly specializes are the exclusivity of capitalism and the needs of only a few people. Instead, architecture should be an inviting, inclusive, and unintimidating spatial framework for the coexistence of humans and non-humans and people's lives and to host slowly private functions should always give something back to its environment or the communities. And in order to promote democracy through problem posing, problem posing should be a holistic and participatory collective effort, bringing together versatile insights from students, educators, and other stakeholders. And this kind of non-exclusionary and low hierarchy approach to problem posing would help students feel that their experiences uh, are valued and that they have ownership over their projects and their designs. Critically position them motivated in transformational thinking against the status quo or beyond it. So to fully integrate sustainability in the design process, we should choose to mimic real life in a different way. Instead of spatializing the inequality and exploitation of the capitalism, we should be spatializing democracy and inclusivity. Architecture education needs to actively break out from its outdated traditions that are unfit to promote sustainability and move to democratic and experiential attitudes. 
students should be actively given tools and possibilities for not only understanding the past and the present, but discovering, pursuing, and celebrating alternative and in the future the goal of architecture education is to enhance students civic responsibility and position themselves in the surrounding society and to teach students to specialize and support and celebrate uh, democracy and inclusivity it could be argued that the whole purpose of the existence of architecture education is not to create sustainable architecture but to be a tool one possible language amongst many for the expression of sustainability in general. And if we are brave enough to open our minds and encounter all these new ideas and perspectives and together challenge the cultures and the values we've been taught and which we live, we will be able to change. Our unsustainable practices are not final, but they can be transformed. And we all have agency and we can all learn to gain more of it. And in the end, we can all uh, become transformative practitioners. Thank you. Thank you, Esty. Thank you, Sophie, the very provo uh, provocative um, talks and so enlightening. If you want these essential shifts, those are the key ones that we need. Um, okay, um, we will open up the discussions afterwards, but next is, is David. Hey. Uh, uh, yes, ready as I'll, I'll ever be. Um, I, I feel a little bit I'm, I'm here and, and the for, false pretenses, but um, I, I, I was going to give a very different uh, kind of approach, uh, view to, to, to the very, I suppose, practical and real issues that come up um, when, when we're trying to achieve some of these, these things that um, we think architects should be capable of, of contributing to in, the, in this area. Um, and, and our role as, as educators and, and how we prepare how we prepare students. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I was uh, going to offer, I suppose, some of the reflections and some of the, some of the steps um, that the, the course at, at um, Scott Sutherland's has recently the changes and the, and the steps that we've been through recently trying to address um, some of these some of these areas particularly the areas of sustainability and and climate um, emergency and the climate crisis uh, because it's is is obviously a, a huge uh, challenge huge task and uh, there there are many 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 different facets to it and probably different approaches as well, and, and I think um, our, our two previous speakers have have touched upon things which are uh, of of uh, fundamental uh, Im importance, but also very general and quite abstract. And and sometimes that can that can be um, very challenging to to achieve in the context um, of of a you know of a course which is limited in scope, limited by resources, etc. Um, so. I um, I think very much um, the the course that we have at, at Scott Sutherland is is probably not unusual in in the UK, but um, some particularities I think are, are useful to 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 know about, and that is that it is quite a small school, um, and we do have other disciplines um, in the school apart from apart from architecture, and it's. Typically, it's a, it's a three plus two uh, kind of arrangement, as as is as is um, quite quite usual. And the the two the two parts have a very different character for those uh, who, who may have a different a different system. And and certainly in the in the what we call the part two, as uh, following the RIB, the RIB in our prescription, the the master's course certainly encourages the student very much to. To find their their own way, and and we hope uh, we hope that we provide that we provide um, um, a framework for them to do that. It's a unit system. It's a two-year unit system, and therefore the students have a, a choice of 
of whom they want to they want to study with or or um, in, in which unit to to kind of pursue their studies and and very much they define their own their own projects and so <clears throat> the part one um, by contrast I suppose is is a lot more the education is a lot more directive and, ha and has been and and um, very often I'm very much concerned with the development of of skills um, and I mean I suppose the shift we've, we've seen sort of recently is that in expanding I suppose in, in expanding the the range of of applicants that that we might uh, invite onto the course is that they have very different skills and we and, and we find that we we have to adapt to 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 where they come from to 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 what uh, they can bring uh, to the course and and help them also develop in the areas that maybe uh, we might have been used to or accustomed to then having um, skills already so I mean, i'm talking about things like um, drawing skills, develop drawing, drawing skills. We have quite often um, very, very good, very capable students that maybe don't have the experience in in art or or design already. Um, so we 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 kind of have to adapt to to those issues too. Um, so I hope that's an that's an undercurrent that that we're adapting to as as well. But in terms of in terms of the the, the climate emergency um, shift, it's obviously something that's been happening for a very long time. Something that uh, scientists have been telling us for a very long time is happening, and I suppose re retrospectively, one might might think that we have been extremely slow in 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 kind of cutting onto it or or or, adapt or addressing um, this issue. I suppose partly because of Legislative, legislative frameworks, um, but it's also true to say that even even in in our school, uh, there are individual members of staff and particular activities and teaching that takes that has been taking place in in this area. I mean, I saw a comment from Gokai there. He's he's been plying this this furrow for for a long time. Um, and and the same could be said of, of some other members of staff uh, in the school and it uh, but it, so it's only within the last few years i'd say three three four years that um that the urgency um of of this uh, issue has begun to to have a visible um effect of, at, at scale on the education that that we're providing or that we're hoping to provide um also, so I'd say it was in it was 2000, 2019 that we went through um, a course restructure, um, and at that point, at that point, we, we had three sort of thematic, uh, thematic I suppose keywords um, topics that that we that we were focusing that restructure, and these. Uh, were digitization, climate emergency, and collaboration because, um, and we think these are actually very closely related. In fact, so when we're talking about um, when we're talking about climate emergency, very quickly um, becomes evident that digital tools are are going to be part of at least the technical aspect of um, of, of design uh, to meet certain <clears throat> performance. Uh, targets and and um, etc. So, um, so so two years ago we went through a whole course restructure uh, in which we began to in, introduce um, um, the subject, I suppose, much more directly. In particular, uh, I think Gillian Gillian Wishard is part of our the, the organising team for this uh, symposium. Um, developed the the the. The module that we, they take in, in second year at the moment, um, which is essentially based ar around low energy design, it takes on a, a lot of their, I suppose, a lot of their methodology or a lot of the systems that that passive house um, that, that passive house uh, certification uses, um, and and introduce it to the students as part of 
part of the design process so that the sort of the design con considerations so that there are um, uh, the technical aspects um, in terms of the the added uh, tech and the performance systems etc et 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 so all these kind of things are um, I would say much more directly and much more holistically as uh, introduced with with the aim of achieving low or very low uh, energy um, buildings um, already in, in stage in stage two of the course. Um, at the same time, we've offered um, low energy housing electives, and this this been an, an elective that's been running. I think Goke has been involved with this um, in the part two. And of course, as, as an elective, it means that not everybody uh, takes it, but it, it's part of uh, in the individual choices students have. Um, and um, and uh, just recently, I suppose, in response to, to the RIBA knowledge schedules that have been published more recently, um, we're undergoing a, a further uh, course restructure, which builds on or, or takes kind of the, the first steps that we that we introduced a couple of years ago um, further still, so that so that the the whole uh, um, theoretical background I think about climate change is is introduced um, right from the start. Um, I should say this is this is the, the plan. Um, that we are developing uh, at the moment for validation this 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 autumn, um, so that we 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 feel that um, almost the most fundamental kind of context um, setting that we can do for the for the students coming into the profession is to say this is this is the sort of fundamental the, the fundamental constraint that your work will have and so we've introduced um, a, a new module which looks at, at, at very much these things and, and all of the kind of professional um, implications um, um, as well so uh, ethics climate um, and and the profession uh, as, as a new module um, <clears throat> I suppose another aspect that we we have in the course uh, as as um, as an ongoing uh, area of exploration is the the area of dealing with existing buildings. This this um, normally happens in third year. I mean, it can happen in other places, but there's a specific studio module that we have in in third year, uh, where students uh, look at adapting um, an existing building. And, and I have to say this this has shifted slightly focus because it. Um, it, it starts, I suppose, years back as a as a kind of adaptive reuse uh, idea, um, but very much now uh, with a kind of retrofit agenda. In other words, uh, sort of improving uh, performance as well as as well as sort of making use of an existing building. And and this is clearly um, of hugely important. A, a great number, if not the majority, of our students are probably going to. Uh, end up working in in these kind of areas, um, and so I think it's really important that that aspect of the course is continued and and emphasised. And in conjunction with um, a whole semester's module on on that subject, which is in, in as I say in stage three, we have um, a technical module um, which is integrated with it to to support that. So so we think um, our students need to be um, capable of um, working with that. And I, I can't believe the time. This is 10, 10 29 already. Um, they, um, I suppose they, um, I, I was struck by, by, by the, my previous speakers and, and the, the, the kind of reference to, to ugliness and beauty. And um, <laughs> I, I think, it, it, it kind of asks the sort of the general question: What is it we're trying to achieve with with um, you know make uh, uh, upskilling students, upskilling staff? Because of course, staff development is a is a key aspect um, of of developing the students' ed education. Um, and um, 
And it's, it struck me that, uh, you know, that perhaps, perhaps beauty, however it's conceived, is, is, can be used as a tool. I mean, it has been, uh, and, and maybe, you know, maybe it is a tenth um, of, of, of the architectural kind of package. I don't know how, how big uh, a part of it it is rather than a third in, in the Vitruvian triad. But, um, but it seems to me that um, but it, it has a role to play. And I just wanted to end with, perhaps with, a, with an image, if I can manage to, to sort out how to share a screen. Let me see, share a screen. Um, I don't know if you can, can you see that? You can see that. So this is um, Aberdeen, Aberdeen Market being uh, demolished um, <laughs> just the other day as I walked past it. And, and here's um, um, a replacement building already. I mean, there was a 19th century beautiful market. John Betjeman sort of lauded it. Um, it was knocked down, a concrete thing put up, um, and now uh, is is being demolished and a student a student of ours um let me see if i can show you something else in in our unit which i i run with neil gillespie um operating home architects um gave us a surprise project i think she she decided to take on to take on Aberdeen Market before it was uh, demolished, and and looked at how it might be reused or reimagined. Um, and I think she 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 kind of made these rather intriguing kind of montages of Palladios and Basilica and Vicenza. Um, with with a kind of re reimagined structure of the of the the concrete building, um, and I think for me that kind of captures the possibilities I think, and perhaps the, even the duties of our uh, architect students and sort of going out there because the case needs to needs to be made and needs to be argued for for these buildings, which are some are, some of them are are ugly twice. <laughs> as they are, and they need to be, I think they need to be beautified so that we don't, um, so that we don't knock them down, which is, as we know, is a, is a big crime. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for all our speakers in the first session. Um, I think there's a wide range in, uh, a, a, a number of issues covered here and I think what's what's really key is architecture is, as we've previously seen has only been about buildings and we need to expand and, and think about the environment and, and society much much wider so it's a it's a huge thing that we need to cover I have a question to start the conversation um, and I suppose it's something that's David's brought up in his talk is that most of us are dealing with a clean slate, not dealing with a clean slate when it comes to our institutions. So in an ideal world, how would you structure a brand new school? Because I think those are the, the difficulties we've got. If we talk about transformational education and transformational ar way we practice architecture, how do you think that if we're in an ideal world, how would we structure our schools in order for that to happen? I don't know if Essie and Sophie, whether you wanted to answer that. Maybe if I, I have some thoughts on that, because just on Monday here at the Bumper School of Architecture, we had a whole day of um, workshopping around our curriculum. And let's be honest here, it's hard work and it's going way out of our comfort zone, especially for the majority of us. And I think we have to acknowledge that. Um, and I also think that, um, that most of us don't realize how much we actually have to change. And it's something having worked for 20 years, I was one of the people teaching all of the like doing more sustainable buildings. And then I realized, you know, and, and like, you know, giving the content, the tools and environmental design and making upfront right decisions. And then I realized in the last few years that why are we going so slow is because we're actually still making those decisions as a tack on an external kind of 
in a way, and we're still producing buildings. Like I think also Essie was trying to bring that out. Um, we're still producing buildings with these old values and these old methods and old techniques and old ways of thinking. And that is something really hard to shift. And so actually, I think provocatively or controversially, when you end up going into year one, uh, so first of all, I'll tell you also to deal with some of the comfort, um, going outside our comfort zone is that we are now trying to create three versions of a change of the curriculum of the whole five years. One is a soft, like acupuncture. What can we do as immediate fixes? Um, is that enough? Is that enough to change the values? And then the, uh, one is really a radical change, like a, some called it a revolution in how we teach it, and then something in between. And we probably have to, even if we want the radical change, we probably have to actually step to the other parts to get to the radical change anyway. Um, but the key is, is I think what I've come to realize, and, and I'm sure others will have opinions on that, is that actually instead in year one, whereby students immediately get into small projects and building, we actually need to teach them perhaps almost no building at all. Um, controversial, but maybe that first year is about the role of the architect, who we serve, the honor we have to serve the public. Um, not, oh, we just want to make this building because we can, uh, that it really shifts the complete attitudes and uses these democratic processes that Essie talked about and diff these different ways and peer-to-peer -peer learning rather than this master apprentice kind of model. Because once we don't set that in year one, it's really difficult to change all of that thinking and way of working in the later years. And we're finding this that our students say in year four, oh my God, I wish I could go back to my year one project, year two, year three project, and I would do it totally different. And it's very difficult, even when they get it, it's very difficult. It's almost like we brainwash them to work one way. And then we're trying to unbrainwash them when they get to master's level. And it's really, really difficult to do that. So I think in year one, we almost have to flip some master stuff. This uh, higher intellectual societal thinking has to perhaps come much, much earlier. And then the building and construction. And it was then ones that, once the students have that knowledge, when they then look at the repertoire of how to select materials, they're going to look at it very, very differently rather than, oh, well, I have a list, tick box, you know, that they otherwise get. And I think it's completely shifting it the other way around. So, but that's where I am at the moment. And it's a very dynamic process of learning and figuring this out as we go along. I totally agree with you there, Sophie. I mean, we, I, th I think year one is always the year that is seen to be the least important and I think it is the most important it sets the scene right the way through and every emphasis is on masters and and the graduating years and I think you're right it's it's and that's where that transformational change can can take place um Essie did you want to come in on that well yeah maybe uh just to uh, follow on that I think one of the key things is that some something that is not really <sighs> often present in how we teach and, and how we, we learn architecture are really the, the practices and the values. And, and quite often when we talk about sustainability and, and integrating it and implementing it, we think we can use the same cultures and the same design processes as we always have to do that sustainable thinking, but it's not possible when sort of we have this idea of these hierarchies and, and things, and then we should be somehow designing equal sustainable things through those hierarchies and I think that's something that as Sophie was saying in the beginning of our school we should really already learn this culture of mutual respect and sort of this culture of like well critical thinking and arguing for what you do and because at least at the moment we often just start to do design as Sophie was saying and I, I and I think that that is a really essential thing and it's a big shift and it's hard for many maybe to change the whole conception of what architecture is even about like should it be about thinking because traditionally it has been about doing but if we don't think what we do what's the point of doing anything really so yeah a lot of messy thoughts about the fact but yeah um, maybe can I just jump in and and, and thank you very much Sophie and Essie and David really interesting to hear your thoughts and it's really interesting to hear you talk about the idea that thinking is what architects really have to do because it's very much in my mind that you know we're so much of what they do is making buildings and yet we know we need to make fewer buildings um, and actually if the architect wants to remain part of the whole construction industry or how we use buildings they probably need to become really imaginative thinkers 
rather yeah. than constructors. Um, but at the moment, um, that of course is a massive cultural change as you're talking about, but it's really refreshing to hear you talk about that. How do we do that and still actually tick all those flipping boxes that we have to do by the end of third year? Um, and I don't want to put a negative in that, but it, it's just it's really great to hear that spoken about because I think that that's you know that is the real shift if we wanted to be actual agents in terms of tackling this whole situation, then the architects as creative thinkers and collaborators could be really valuable because they won't be particularly valuable if all they're interested in doing is making buildings. Um, yeah, thanks. If I, yeah, I, sorry, David, you might want to jump in as well, but I, uh, I completely agree with you, Gillian, um, that the thinking is so important. And actually, I don't think it jeopardizes anything at all of the ARB and the RIBA criteria. You no longer have the EU criteria, we still do, because there's so much, there's so, even the, the changed ARB and REBA criteria, they're still very generic actually. And there's so much room you can maneuver in that. And you have three years to play with. And actually, I have a suspicion that when we teach architecture in a different way and uh, sustainable architecture, that as Essie said, in a way, we still talk about sustainable architecture in a way it should be just good architecture and part of everything we do. And it's just a way of achieving a sustainable society. But if we teach in the right way, I think it will massively help students learning better and easier and making decisions about everything else. So it actually supports all of the other processes that come after. And one of the things that I guess where, where my epiphany was is that we often, for example, at East London University, Sheffield, we end up with lectures, a whole lecture series on sustainable architecture or on renewables. And, we have, you know, and then we think, well, students have these lectures so they've now been taught but then actually, when you do pedagogical research, you find that you, that's not how students are going to learn and be able to apply it into their own projects. You need very specific teaching activities that lead to learning activities and learning in between the classroom, which is also, I think, David, what you picked up on as well, that um, this notion of digital uh, uh, learning and stuff, that actually one of the things Essie also found with our Art for Change research, Sarah and, uh, and Emma are here, is also blended learning are really good ways of doing it. So we spend our time as teachers in the classroom face to face for the really important stuff of discussing what they learned outside the classroom, pre-recorded lectures or readings, and then applying it and helping them apply it and to think about it and ask questions. But it does, it does require that shift from teachers just going in and always talking about the design project without that context, without necessarily thinking of what are these learning outcomes um, or what are these yeah these higher level uh, achievements we we want yeah that's so important to think it allow them to think and develop first um alice you had your hand up she wants to come in yeah hi it's kind of a connected question i think for essie and um sophie so like how do you reassure students within that within change like because like so when you're bringing in kind of different ways of discussion, different ways of developing a project, different ways, and even kind of when you remove design from the equation, like how do you deal with like the pressure these students are under and, you know, in terms of learning outcomes, in terms of modularization, and like a huge amount of like, I mean, I'll present later uh, the, some of the changes we make, we've been making, but a huge amount of the work has been actually trying to reassure students that, you know, if they take a chance and they do something different, they don't design a building, that that will be supported. And partly it's in the learning outcomes, but how do you, how do you address this, you know? I think, do you want to jump first, Essie? Yeah. yeah, I could, I could, because this is actually a pretty interesting topic we've been discussing in a lot with our own students. And, and for us, it's, it's really interesting to see that, for example, this need for sharing ideas and talking has actually come a lot from students. They're asking for chances to talk. They're sort of fed up of just sitting home alone and doing their designs. They really want this kind of bigger connections for, for doing things. And I think we just had uh, a year three housing design course with our students, which we massively redesigned with Sophie. And, and we were taking quite a chance to provide a lot of space for discussion through workshops and, and, and bigger peer discussions. And, and I think a crucial change that happened there was that when students are uncertain of, of what they are allowed to do 
that comes sort of uh, from this need for external validation. So they have learned that somebody needs to validate their behavior so that they can do something. But then when you provide people with the opportunity for self-reflection and, and reflection with others, you start to gain this self-motivation and you start to rely a lot less on, on this external sort of, can I do this, can I do that? And I think by the end of our course, my students had sort of stopped asking whether they can actually do something or not. They had sort of learned, they had internalized the culture of, of sort of, yeah, they can just read something and they can apply it. And then we're just sitting there and be like, yes, that's a really good thing. Like just being enthusiastic about their passions and not forcing our passions on them. Fairly often in these discussive learning events, it happened that we didn't intend the discussions to teach students some things that ended up being taught sort of through that collective reflection and that's quite scary for a teacher in many ways that you can't sort of predict what's going to happen when when you teach but I think that sort of gave them something immensely valuable and you could see they, they really I think there were three students that came to me after the course and they were saying that during COVID, they had think, thought that they might want to change profession. They might want to quit architecture because they don't see the purpose. They don't see their own position in it. And then after the course, they were like, yeah, we were talking so much and sharing so much that I think I might stay. Like, I don't really want to go anymore. I sort of figured out what I can be passionate about. And I think that was the most beautiful thing to happen. And that sort of reassured that all trying out these new things actually is really beneficial in the end. I don't know if you, Sophie, want to um, jump Yeah, in. we still have time. I don't have a huge amount to add to that other than um, we are lucky in that we have a lot of agency freedom within our courses, um, how the day fit together as well. Um, so I have a lot of agency to make change. We are also lucky because we only have about 50, 55 students in each year. Um, and it's a very structured and prescribed, like while we have a lot of freedom, it's still within a quite uh, rigid structure in itself. But one of the, so we know students uh, by name or pretty much, you know, when you first see them. But one of the things we also did is we told them at the very beginning, we've made changes and why. And I think they also then realized that there was some, like it wasn't randomly done, like, oh, but you know, and in the end, the course Essie is talking about had the highest feedback from students that we've ever had on any course. So, but it's really taking students with you along the way. And we also then broke down because particularly we only see them in year three. I have no courses at year two and year one. So changing the values is really difficult in year three already. So we also then broke down uh, a lot of the learning activities in very small weekly components and very clearly said, we mapped them against UN Sustainable Development Goals or clearly against the learning outcomes. We always said why that they're doing this and guiding them through. So they had kind of sort of uh, trust in us and it was a mutual trust as well uh, built that way. And then I think as Essie says, a lot of it actually comes from students. Students have asked, We've had students a month ago, we, so we did master's this week, we did the, the bachelor's a month ago, uh, curriculum day with you, and we had uh, bachelor's students, and particularly our bachelor's students, they said, there is no architecture in a climate crisis, who cares? Like, you know, fix this stuff. Like, why are we not learning about this more? Um, and so it's actually, a lot of it is driven by our students. And I think harness that grassroots uh, potential and then these democratic processes of how you teach uh, as well, I think is key. Thank you. Thank you both. You know, a, a big provocation to, to education is there perhaps there is no architecture in early years. And we just, you know, you just see the big picture before you dive in. I mean, that's, that's a, but actually, that's a, uh, interesting, yeah. it's a really interesting way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, but maybe it's even, uh, Kathy, maybe it's even... What is the architecture? I think that the climate crisis changes it. I always saw that architecture was building. But actually, some practices focus on participatory processes to enable sustainable development to happen. Some practices focus on post-occupancy evaluation. There's some focus on research. There's so many different ways to be an architect. And I know Libra 1 and Part 2 have got very specific criteria, but we don't teach enough of that. And I'm looking forward to hearing Felicity, you talk about this, because that's sort of like the, the trajectory of Part 3 as well, right? Like, what are the different trajectories that 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 
architects get at. And I think we don't teach enough about the transferable skills and the needs elsewhere in society of what architects can contribute to. Um, and the idea is always about building. Maybe sometimes it's deciding nothing needs to be built at all. That's architecture too. Yeah, it is. Right, um, I'm going to bring in Andy because he's had Andy Summers because he's, he's wanting to, to jump in. And then after that, I'll bring in John Thorne. And then we've got, a we've got 10 minutes left, so I think we can cover quite a bit of ground we need to pick up after that. So, Andy. Thanks, Cathy. Yeah, just um, uh, just wanted to share uh, an article that uh, Kirsty Lees and I are kind of referencing as we kind of go through the kind of thoughts that as we change the stage four course for the next academic year here. Um, it's uh, an article by Julia Steinberger published back in May, and she's just talking about the kind of numbness that she was encountering talking to students about climate change and the work that's required, because in essence, the, the anger and the kind of frustration uh, from younger people knowing that the actual decision makers aren't taking the correct decisions to take in terms of national governments and corporations. So, you know, we, we can all try our best, obviously, but there's a very kind of growing sense that they can see very clearly who isn't taking leadership and who should be. And we're just sort of looking at this article as we go through the curriculum here, trying to kind of think about how we also share and talk about the power dynamics that go on within and around architecture, because obviously as a profession, I think we could be far better at really understanding our context better and also the vested interests that we are having to engage with beyond our kind of um, professionalized focus. And I think it's, I'm just sharing the article with regards to kind of thoughts about, you know, how we also talk about popular struggle um, and how we can kind of help generate thoughts and education about how to be activists um, together, to work together, to try and kind of move beyond the, 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 the charts and the statistics, which are hugely important, obviously, but as I say, through, through Julia's piece, you just experienced a kind of numbness um, of, of being told this information. And what we're just trying to think about here is also kind of how we try and talk about the organizing that's required um, and learning from popular struggle for, from people that generally don't have a lot of power, i.e. individuals, and how we can work together. So um, yeah, I just wanted to share that article because for us, it's quite important, I think, to try and talk about a reality of the context because there's a, there is a kind of widespread um, understanding that actually we can do a lot, but actually without the powers that be actually making the decisions and changing things, uh, we kind of just go around in circles. So uh, yeah, I think it's just trying to bring into the education here um, a wider picture about and learning from popular struggle out beyond architecture, talking about vested interests very explicitly um, and giving us a more real life context about how we're trying to navigate through uh, these structures. Did either Sophie, Essie or David want to come back in on, on Andy's comments? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll move on to John. You had your hand up. Thanks, Kathy. And fantastic speakers today and, and a huge amount of food for thought. And my role's, I think, unique in Scotland in that I'm a very junior member of staff, but I'm an environmentalist who works with architecture students and staff, designers and artists. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that question we posed at the beginning, that was posed at the beginning about what is a suitable response. And I think IPCC and what we're saying about climate change is, if you look at planetary boundaries, for example, from the Stockholm Institute, climate change is probably the least of our worries. And uh, I think a suitable response is that we have to treat, you know, anyone that we're teaching, their lives are at risk. This is a, this is a risk of extinction and, and it sounds, overly dramatic, but I think I'll be dead by the time this really hits. But I think for the students I talk to, they're openly distressed and angry about this. And they're distressed sometimes by their courses. And I don't just mean at GSA. I think there's fantastic work in the last few years happening at GSA. I talk to students across, across Scotland and the UK on this. Um, and I think distress is the right word. Anxiety for me pathologizes it and, and makes it look like you've got a disease. Um, but I think students are distressed and angry and we have to address that. But I see architecture and, and design as, as positive changes in changing what is a systems problem. We, we've designed a system that's, that's killing humanity and the planet and architecture can be a positive response uh, to that. I think there has to be a student-led element to the curriculum because frankly, a lot of the students know more than the academics sometimes. And 
that is a real issue for academia because it's built on a patriarchy and a colonial system that really can't accept that professors like to be taught by professors but you know when you've got students who are maybe 20 22 they potentially know a lot more than a professor in their 70s or 80s i certainly wasn't taught this stuff at school i had a fantastic secondary school education didn't have climate change mentioned once the only people who really knew about it were shell and bp and so so when you look at the structure that's another thing that's stopping us climate change and environmentalism isn't mentioned in program specifications the very bedrock of, of what we teach and that's not just gsa it's across many institutions it's not in the teaching because we're not supporting tutors and academics to actually teach this stuff so we need a huge uh push on uh see uh, you know continuing professional development and we're bringing in climate literacy and we're talking to all staff uh, in three big sessions and teaching weeks next year we've got a new uh framework at gsa which is launching in the autumn about environmental and social justice because these things are linked you can't talk about environmental issues without social justice issues this is a colonial issue this is a slavery issue this is a race issue this is a gender issue and the work kathy and others does at gsa with missing in architecture is amazing because we need that creativity we need that feminism in, in architecture because it's so often missing in architecture from what i hear is quite a brutal uh, sector that forces out creativity and, and the feminist voice and increases the patriarchal one. Uh, we need co-design because often uh, I, I hear of students actually uh, designing spaces and buildings without actually talking to the people who live there and not learning how to talk to people there. And I, I've heard some great experiences with co-design and architecture, but we need more of it uh, right across the right across the industry. Um, we need support from people like Architecture Fringe, yeah, it's fantastic to have that. Anthropocene Architecture School, and Scott McCauley, I would also say queer theory, because we really need to shake things up from this linear patriarchal model we've got. We need that strategically. We need this to come not only from the students, from the academics and the tutors, uh, but we need a strategic lead saying this is number one priority, because if we destroy our home, it really doesn't matter what else we do. And we also, like has been said, it has to be one of many things. It has to still look beautiful. It still has to be uh, stunning architecture, but we can do both, uh, I believe, in, in architecture. What I've seen at GSA is some fantastic examples of really beautiful buildings that almost don't look green or uh, sustainable, but they're just fantastic buildings which are absolutely uh, efficient and really hit all the marks when it comes to environmental and social justice. And finally, it's just positive PR. You know, this is fantastic for, for GSA, it's fantastic for the industry. If we actually do this that we actually say we cut that 40 percent of impact out um, and i think that's future proofing architecture schools everywhere it doesn't matter where you are if we don't do this you know any architecture school who doesn't do this is dead in 10 years so i really want somewhere like gsa and msa to be a fantastic leader in this to be cutting edge for it to be challenging it for, for it to be uncomfortable that we actually have to ask you know maybe as academics who've maybe done 20 30 years that we have to ask students who are 20, how do we do this? And I think that's part of the co-design, co-education that we need. Thanks. Okay, John, thanks very much. Um, we are now at 10.58. We're gonna try and take a five minute break. Um, that's fantastic conversations and may these continue somehow, <laughs> maybe in the next session as well um, with more provocations. So if we take a five minute break, We'll do precisely five minutes. Everybody needs a cup of tea or a, a comfort break. And we'll come back at precisely 10, 11.02, 11.03, can't count, 11.03. <laughs> and we'll try and get back on track. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.
Right, should we have everybody back? Sorry, it's such a short time. <laughs> the more discussions we can have. <laughs> Okay. okay, right. I'll hand over to you, Gillian. Sure. So, um, just finding where we are. Yeah, so we're now moving into the second session of the morning, which is entitled Studio Shifts. First, we're going to have a, a keynote talk from Felicity Atekpe, and then we'll have two presentations of studio projects by staff and students from Asala and UCD. I'm going to introduce all the speakers now rather than interrupt the session. So uh, Felicity Atekpe is an Associate Professor and Director of Professional Practice at Bartlett. She's a practicing architect and founder of White Table Architects, specializing in sustainable design, interiors, architecture and landscape. Her academic interests include innovative pedagogies, ethics and alternative routes to qualification and equitable urban landscapes. Felicity has 20 years experience as an educator and has taught and examined widely in the UK, including at the Bartlett, Glasgow School of Art and Cambridge University. Following Felicity's talk, our first project presentation is from Asala, Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape. Staff members, Simone Ferracina and Dr. Moa Carlson. Simone is a lecturer in architectural design. His research and teaching interrogate alternative design ecologies, invention and consumption, and his interests include the reactivation of wastes, Dr. Moa Carlson is a lecturer in architectural design and her research includes the history of 20th century infrastructure, computer mapping and information technology and landscape and urban planning. They are joined by students Sonakshi Pandit and Joseph Sims. Following that, uh, we will have a project presentation from UCD, University College Dublin, staff members Alice Clancy and Robert Whiteman. Alice is Assistant Professor and Director of Teaching and Learning at UCD's School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. She's an architect whose practice involves architectural education, photography and curation. Collaboration is at the heart of all aspects of Alice's practice. Her photographic work has been widely published and she worked on the curatorial team of the 2018 Venice Biennale led by Grafton Architects. Robert Whiteman is a practicing architect and a design fellow at UCD. He also teaches at the University of Limerick and on the joint programme run by Dundee University and Wuhan University in China. And they're joined by students Aoife Casey and Owen Gurren. So without further ado, I will pass over to you, Felicity, to start the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone see the screen? Let me just try and view the slideshow. Yes. Um, so I, I'm going to apologize before I start, because what I've done is reframed a, a global view, particularly in relation to um, pedagogies, architectural pedagogies. And I'm actually going to read um, just because I, I think people learn just as well reading as well as talking. Um, and if I start by saying we all know that architectural education in the UK in particular embraces a wide spectrum of knowledge underpinned by a requirement for multiple perspectives and ways of teaching that enable students to be taught empirical information, as well as art and finally the impact of their design on um, in terms of psychology and sociology. However, I think the premise of this holy grail of education is fraught with ambiguities and conflicting responsibilities. Firstly, to effectively and with equity achieve the broadest aims of the education, the profession must reflect society and allow the most diverse representation of the world. Secondly, these ethical issues have fundamental implications on how we teach design. Sustainability under whose umbrella ecology and climate emergencies lie is a threshold concept. The word is problematic and too familiar, so students and educators don't take on its threshold implications. We need to reframe architectural education as an ecology. Paying attention to students' environment and influences could also help students make sense and navigate the wider world. Sustainability must be understood in these contexts to really affect radical essential shifts in how we teach the architectural curriculum. 
To address its implications, we need to move from a mentality of abundance to scarcity in every aspect of our thinking. To consider the inputs that sh should shape the education in relation to other aspects of teaching architecture and its signature pedagogies, we must start with a new lexicon for architecture and practice that puts into perspective the last three centuries of European dominance. This is understood as an epoch of inequity based on abundance and couched in a narrative of survival of the fittest. A new pedagogy should put humanity back in its rightful place as the mammals we are and develop a creaturely pedagogy that pays particular and equal attention to all other species and our planet. This new pedagogy needs to address equity by acknowledging that we, not, do, we do not all start from the same place and adjust the imbalances at the start of an architectural education. We need to have a holistic view of design and critical thinking to include more explicitly the technical and cultural context in a more integrated manner so that it reflects evolving art and scientific thinking and the implications of Darwinian theory as it is not the strongest in, of the species that survives, but rather that which, which, which is most adaptable to change. It is therefore never just the survival of the fittest, however, it is survival of an entire ecosystem. Adaptability, not strength, and biodiversity is needed for adaption to change. We should more carefully consider how we can design learning environments to celebrate and use the diversity of our students. Their approaches to learning, their coping skills, and different experiences that they bring to their learning to provide a new perspective. Learning for BRICS, at its most fundamental level, there needs to be a re-establishment of a relationship in pedagogy between the teacher, student, and task at hand in a context of new learning outcomes to determine the context to be taught and its assessment. Brig calls this constructive um, alignment in our thinking about climate and ecologies. This applies especially to the role of practice and professional studies in the education. There can be no absolute answers rather than a way of communication. Therefore, only the framework of learning outcomes can be the accurate judge of a broad, a broad range of solutions to the problem and provide parity in the system and eliminate subjectivity. I believe that our current university model fails because it integrates the equivalent of stage two of the plan of works in parts one and two in design and relies on work experience to apply other broad skills and key aspects of the learning, particularly part three. This leaves constructive alignment vulnerable to the vagaries of the workplace, namely how the critical aspects of the architectural education received are understood and applied in a professional setting. Whatever the creative solutions, statutory requirements, legal obligations, construction and building technologies must be met to a standard that does not endanger lives and still caters for the more esoteric aspects of living as human beings, such as delight, joy and belonging. The inclusive curriculum has many facets, including attention, equality, ease, appreciation, encouragement, feelings, informative, difference, and place. Ease is of paramount importance because it facilitates the other qualities, confronting the anxieties of learners and learning. Instead of the increasingly full curriculum content that requires a superficial understanding of the issues, we need to decide which are the critical skills essential to our students, where students bring to the classroom a knowledge of the achievements of their cultures to be incorporated in the curriculum through co-creation. Effective learners learn in a bewilderingly number of ways, each revealing distinct strengths and a lack of alternative styles. The term understanding is a key part of architectural pedagogy. The term relates to the amount of knowledge that someone has acquired throughout their education where they can have a more informed options upon how to achieve a defined result. Understanding is a product of time and the student will acquire a relevant amount of information to be able to eventually comment on the subject matter. 
why are architectural students taught through a problem-based learning pedagogy by practicing architects? In contrast, engineers are taught largely from lectures, practical demonstrations and engineering workshops, exclusively by academics and assessed through exams. Project-based learning is a signature pedagogy, generally assumed to be better for less academic learners. However, questioning this should provide a driver for an exploration of a new radical alternative to turn experience into learning. Similarly, although architectural academics are amongst the most hardworking and committed teachers I have ever met, we should also rethink the balance between teaching practitioners and academics and their role in the education. Teaching academics and practitioners with the least training, preparation, oversight, staff development, familiarity with institutional processes and values have the largest influence in the student experience through studio teaching. We need to pay greater attention to what learners are interested in and also how they learn to design the new curriculum. Students who are anxious because they are not doing very well are generally reluctant to abandon their existing methods even if they aren't working well, to completely new untrained alternatives. The sentence above feels like an applicable one for our current architectural education. In particular, the attention of the education needs to refocus on the problems with our existing assessment me methods, which introduce far too much subjectivity into the process. This is evident in the way non-traditional students do much worse in architecture as they are mostly not represented in the marking team. So far, peer-to-peer -peer reviews and self-reflection have been an invaluable way to address these subjectivities to cre create a culturally respons responsive course context. We, can we think of new ways of assessment or at, le at the very least adopt tried and tr tested solutions from other pedagogies? It is very important, therefore, that students are supported and encouraged to explore the potential of the academic freedom that they are provided with, while inhibiting a safe environment that allows them to experiment and fail. It is no coincidence that students of architecture suffer the most psychological problems during their studies. We are teaching a way of thinking and applying that thinking, and where there are no right or wrong solutions, provided the student can clearly demonstrate their approach, application and reflection in their design. We all acknowledge that architectural education is failing some people, other creatures, and most of all nature. I think in part because of its pluralist aims, which means that the curricula are forever being added to, and also in its equity, not just with those who are easy to identify as the underrepresented. The statistics are alarming. According to Susie, only 18% of students who begin architectural education qualify as architects. This is an enormous attrition rate in a profession where when first year students are interviewed, an overwhelming number say that architecture has been a childhood dream. If we look at the RIBA client satisfaction survey, this provides a further sobering impetus. Registered architects score highly in design, particularly for private, domestic and commercial clients, where the satisfaction is generally above 70% and the highest for developing and interpreting the brief. Less so with, with contractor clients, where the score is around the 50% mark. However, when it comes to satisfaction with their ability to provide the wraparound services, this drops by 20% across the board something is clearly going awry in the education of our architects. I think we should let go of Gropius's Bauhaus theories from the 1920s, which have been the basis of most of the education in the 20th century, and devise a new lexicon of approaches which better reflect our current century and its urgent implications. Higher education institutions are notoriously resistant to change, despite the overwhelming evidence of best practice and the need to change signature pedagogies, and this is acute in architecture. The world has changed. However, what the ex executive secretary of the UC, UNCCD said in draft 
drought in numbers could be equally applied to architecture. We need to stare towards the solutions rather than continuing with destructive actions, believing that marginal change can heal systemic failure. And I, I just thought I would also share some of the, the statistics. Um, the cost of being a student in architecture is nearly 24K a year. Um, without financial support, most students can't um, practice uh, or be at a school of architecture. Uh, a staggering number have been asked to work for free. And you know, if we look at just how many want to be architects and still want to be architects and the difference between non-white and white respondents, um, what their worries are um, and what they, whether they think the education is actually providing them with the knowledge they need, I think these also help um, with what we want to do. And then finally, uh, if nothing else, just looking at the the graphs for their mental health prognosis is um, impetus for change. So my takeaway is that we have to go from abundance to scarcity, and we have to really think about what's included in our curriculum and revise our pedagogy. Thank you. Thank you, Felicity. That's a really thought-provoking talk. Thanks very much indeed. Um, Moa and Simone, would you like to carry on with and present us with your project please sure absolutely and wow what a presentation to follow thank you for today that was uh just amazing so let me just share my slides here um okay like that perfect so uh we are from the edinburgh school of architecture and landscape architecture and um Myself and three uh, uh, colleagues will give you some examples of how topics of ecological and climate emergencies are taught in our school. And um, we're lucky that everything at Asala doesn't uh, need to change. What we are doing is kind of based on a long tradition of, of working with environmental questions. And we have colleagues who have for a very long time been working on these topics. Uh, some of whom are in the audience today. Um, I am Mua Carlson. I'm a lecturer in architectural design. And if the rest of the team just wants to say hi and who you are, that would be great. Maybe yes, hello. Someone. I'm Simone Ferracina. I'm a lecturer in architectural design and detail at Sala. Uh, hi, I'm Joe Sims, um, and I'm a fourth year student in uh, the undergraduate architecture program. Hi, I'm Sonakshi Pandit, and I was a student at Isala. Great, thank you so much. So first, Simona and I will uh, discuss two different design studios that we teach and give some examples of our pedagogies and why we teach the way we do, um, and some of the sort of issues and potential uh, hurdles that we're trying to overcome. And then after that, Sonakshi and Joe will give some examples of uh, their uh, work and the processes that they use to design. So first I hand over to you, Simone. Excellent. Um, thank you, Moa. Uh, so I will begin by talking about a third year undergraduate studio called Radical Harvest, which I teach with Asad Khan at Isala. The studio asks students to survey, track, and pay attention to the material flows uh, within a block of their choice in Edinburgh and then to divert and reactivate the resulting wastes through design. So the first shift um, to, to follow the prompt of this event in pedagogical terms is the use of established architectural methods and drawing conventions to register, study, represent. So in other words, to, to make visible and to make worthy of architectural attention materials and processes that would normally be ignored. And if we move to the next slide, the, the, the second um, is a shift in the methodological ground for design, which doesn't begin with aspirations, where, with conceptual framings, with art historical baselines or formal compositional considerations, but with a survey of local and embodied materials. So listening to and experimenting with them and prototyping ways to reuse and repurpose discarded objects. 
and turn them into valuable construction assemblies and materials. So if conventional architectural design and teaching start from a material tabula rasa, and matter gains value only insofar as it is an embodiment or translation of ideas or intentions, students here learn to prioritize pre-existing materials, to meet them uh, on their own terms, and to give them a voice. And over the years, students have worked um, with a wide variety of discarded or low-value objects, uh, with milk cartons, which you see here, discovering their compressive strength and folding them inside out to reveal shiny aluminum surfaces with plastic corks on the right combined into construction blocks that can be assembled and disassembled according to different uses users or needs and and here i'm borrowing pages from my book um, ecologies of inception design potentials on a warming planet which was published um, yesterday actually um, with rags and discarded clothes, which became intrinsically human-scaled building blocks, with exhausts and metal scrap, which, like the clothes, would otherwise be shipped to Asia for recycling, um, with dog and human hair felted into architectural surfaces, with hangers, which became, um, because of their shape, um, uh, hold uh, inherent structural capabilities, with tires, glass and plastic bottles, weeds, books, avocado peels, paper, and um, so on. And just a week or so ago, uh, I collaborated with six Radical Harvest alumni to develop, um, scale up, and combine some of their material systems into an installation that, over the course of Genova Design Week in Genova, Italy, attracted many visitors, uh, many of whom uh, were very short, as you can see on the right, and enjoyed interacting with it. Um, anyway, so aside from the various tectonic inventions that emerged and continue to emerge from the studio, a few key aspects are worth mentioning before passing the baton to Moa to discuss the next studio. Firstly, that the processes of one-to-one -one experimentation with materials we encourage generate knowledges. And these knowledges cannot be imparted. Uh, we don't have them before students start, uh, but stem from the iterative and rigorous encounter between the students and the material systems under consideration. Secondly, it is through these material-driven knowledges that the discarded objects become viable as materials. And this means that in the unit, we are no longer able to decouple materials from the relational and situated ecologies that make them so and upon which they depend. Thirdly, in order to source the necessary materials, students started to weave networks of collaboration, care, and trust with the people working in local bars, hairdressers, bike shops, restaurants, cafes, etc., who are asked to really go out of their way to set aside, collect, or separate discarded materials for the students to pick up and to continue to do so over the course of several weeks. This is an 11 week long course. In addition, the work of preparation following these weekly collection of materials often involves washing and drying, repairing and mending practices. And this usefully reframes and reconfigures architectural design, questioning the presumed separation of intellectual and manual labor, design, building and maintenance. And I should conclude by saying uh, that some of these hyper-local approaches can be easily, very easily criticized for the limited impact on uh, um, real-world waste flows and on the reduction of actual material throughput. Um, while there is merit in these criticisms, with which I uh, fully agree, uh, my hope is that the pedagogy of reuse, care, and responsibility of the studio and its ethical regrounding of design and materials will promote environmental responsibility not as a form of expertise that can be gained, or not only, but as a collective form of life. And that said, um, I will pass the mic to Moa for the next studio. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Simone. So the next studio I will talk about is called No Blank Slate, Architectures of Reuse. And this is a fourth year undergraduate design studio that I teach together with Simona. 
And in this studio, like, just like the previous one Simone presented, we work with embodied materials, but in a slightly different way. Our focus is on reuse, deconstruction, and also to some degree on adaptive reuse. In this studio, all design projects start from an existing building and an existing site in the Edinburgh region. And hence, we have that title, No Blank Slate. Uh, we work with local stakeholders that come from uh, th that range from the owners of these sites to contractors to local campaigners and activists to experts in deconstruction, uh, such as Rotor and Recircle in Oslo and Brussels. So the shift in this studio in pedagogical turn is that um, is in this studio, the idea is not to impose a new design on a blank receiving slate, but rather to first get to know these sites intimately, um, its fabric, its anatomy of parts and components, its level of decay, levels of toxicity and so on, before we start to intervene. So really the uh, uh, ethos of our studio is to have the most uh, benefit from the least amount of effort. So the studio begins with a thorough survey of these sites and an, an evaluation of uh, the con uh, condition of building parts, components, and so on. And in this phase, the students work very much like building uh, surveyors. And you can see a, an example here of the uh, old Medelvik car factory site in, in uh, Granton. And these surveys then lead to individual design projects. Here is uh, such a project for the Granton site where uh, one of our students, uh, Ryan Liu, has kind of creatively flipped the central steel trusses to reactivate this building and give it a new life. Uh, here is a flat lay of another uh, building and an exploded axle of a uh, Victorian villa in Murrayfield. So the students start with taking stock they survey, they evaluate these sites in a very sort of hands-on manner, and then they produce drawings such as these. So designing in this way requires quite a deep level of technical understanding that our students don't always have when they come into the studio. And this is one of the things that we battle with. Because one really needs to understand how these buildings come together and what the parts are and how they fit and relate to one another in order to understand how to hack or improve or modify them. And our studio, our pedagogical tactic, if you like, is to first produce models and then produce drawings. And we think that if you can build something um, uh, physically, then uh, you can likely uh, draw it as well. So the design process we follow is also deeply rooted in place. It is not driven by formal precedents, but rather from tectonic opportunities that are unique to each site. And students spend time with these buildings to, to discover and tune in to such tectonic design opportunities. The material specifications are also rooted in place and students are asked to know precisely where their materials come from, the steps and amount of both labor and carbon required to produce and uh, procure them. The projects are also designed with disassembly in mind. Our stu students need to consider how their buildings might come to an end and how materials can be recovered from them later. And we have found that this twist of the brief of the pedagogy sometimes is met with some uh, resistance and that students are not used to thinking about this, how their uh, kind of design projects will, will eventually be uh, removed or come apart again. But once they do get on board with that idea, they find that designing uh, the deconstruction process and the disassembly protocols into their design is actually a highly uh, creative act. Here we can see Carrie Sue and Chloe uh, So's uh, reconfiguration of the uh, Craig Leith Superstore here in Edinburgh, uh, which they transform into a modern fun palace, with, which is highly uh, reconfigurable. 
often our students focus on a specific type of component that they discover that yields a tectonic idea that then drive their projects. And you will see two examples of really fantastic uh, projects later with Sonakshi and Joe's project. Um, so in general, uh, we learn a huge amount from our students and with our students. So this is not a studio in which the students are supposed to learn from the masters and, and then reproduce that knowledge, but we really discover and do research together and we work with uh, engineers and other uh, consultants to really develop kind of unique uh, tectonic and technical solutions with their uh, buildings and, and building systems. This year, uh, Cole Drury developed a set of subtractive design protocols, which were really, really interesting to us. So by carefully removing parts and opening up a very close to Victorian school building, he basically uh, made the, the, the site suitable for modern programs. So again, going back to Sophie's point that architecture can be uh, uh, subtractive or uh, also a matter of removing uh, things from the built fabric. So finally, although we don't talk that much about it really, uh, there is a certain wish from Simona and myself to infuse the students with a sense of responsibility. That, that there is an ethic, there needs to be an ethic underlying their work that allows them to make decisions about their projects. The point is that sustainability and sustainable design isn't about box ticking and rather, uh, but that it's rather about situated knowledges and care and also that design um, sustainable solutions will be different on each site. And in our studio, sustainability really has nothing to do with kind of objective uh, knowledge. It's, it's all uh, highly situated. And I really like that uh, term Gillian uh, mentioned in the beginning of appropriate, what's appropriate. And that's really what the studio is about. It's about understanding uh, what, the, what the options are for a particular site and uh, what the benefits and drawbacks of each are. Um, so next I will hand over to our first student, which I think is Joe. And I think Joe, if you just say next, then I will, I will change the slide when, when you like. So over to you. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, if we just go on to the next slide, start now. Um, so as Moa said, all our projects um, are based at existing buildings um, as opposed to having a, a kind of blank slate approach. Um, so my site this year was uh, Camberth Ness and Priory over in North Lanarkshire, which was a, a really unique site to work on uh, because of its historical value um, and also the kind of the, the quality of the building materials with this historic sandstone. Um, but also it was completely in a state of of disrepair and, and ruin having been kind of burnt out and vandalized for the last 40 years or so. Um, so we, we began the project by visiting this site, um, carrying out a survey, um, but not, not kind of just a, a building survey, but really a, a structural survey of the existing components and materials, um, which meant thinking about um, what was already on the site, what might be removed from the site, what might be reused on the site, um, and how we could intervene and deconstruct those elements. Um, so my project kind of leaped forward um, about halfway through the semester when we had a, a short workshop with, um, with Rota from, from Belgium. Um, we visited several salvage yards in Glasgow. And um, at this point, I, I kind of started to think about material interventions in my projects and started working with um, scaffolding boards for a few reasons, uh, just because they're, they're very widely available, affordable, um, and they come in these modular lengths, so they really lend themselves to, to these kind of modular structures. Um, so I was actually able to purchase some of these scaffold boards during this trip. Um, if you could go on to the next slide, please, Moa. Which then evolved into um, kind of designing this, this structure, this key structure, um, which was built at one-to-one -one scale to test it out, which gave me a pretty good understanding of of how the system could be constructed um, and both deconstructed at the same time, just using bolts. Um, could you go on to the next slide, please? Um, so this uh, this kind of simple tectonic system um, really evolved around a system for both um, installing a new program, but also supporting the existing structure at the same time. Um, so the the proposal kind of worked through several phases of development. With the first phase just being supporting the structure and gradually repairing the existing building fabric before slowly moving towards 
a full programme um, and new facilities for the surrounding community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as well as these scaffolding boards, um, I also focused on uh, reused windows, which I sourced um, from the local area using online sites, mainly Gumtree. Um, so for this phase of research, I was drawing uh, kind of harvest maps. Um, so all the windows here that I'd, I'd uh, let laid out on this facade were from within 50 kilometers of the site. So this, this studio ethos really focuses around not just reusing materials and buildings, but also um, thinking about material flows and local uh, patterns of reuse. Um, and as much as um, the, the kind of program this building focused around um, a small community center and distillery, but really the, um, the kind of overriding ethos of this project was um, as much about having a system of system of building and a system of repair um, that was actually very adaptable and could be deconstructed or moved. Um, so I'll hand over to Sanakshi now. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, so my project um, was uh, a, it, it was basically considering transforming a retail park, Craigleaf Retail Park, which is a retail park in Edinburgh, into a material library, a, a test bed to prototype the diversion of low value materials and upcycle them into architectural components. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we were asked to survey and, and catalog materials, obviously that, that we would reuse um, and repurpose. Um, and we were obviously kind of asked to kind of look at the existing elements on the site. Um, and so the project uh, repur repurposes the existing structures, but also one of the main kind of materials that stood out to me personally on within the retail park typology were the shopping carts and the great kind of number of shopping carts on the site. I counted like around 950 shopping carts. Um, and so the project proposes to upcycle shopping carts into gabions or what I call gabion carts. Um, and then and then I was also kind of mapping the supply chain for these shopping carts across retail parks um, in across Edinburgh. Um, uh, to kind of better understand the material flow um, and the entire project is premised around um, the affordances identified within the shopping cart um, and, and, and in turn within the, the gaming cart the fact that uh, they can be filled they can be opened um, etc it all kind of started from there and the affordances then kind of inform the key decisions the structural programmatic environmental social strategies of the project the resulting gabion carts are used to construct a load-bearing modular wall filled with rubble, which is sourced from demolition works across the city. Um, and, and you can kind of see the construction sequence there, which is uh, largely informed by uh, the, um, the, afford the, the kind of, the, the different kind of affordances of the shopping cart, how the filling method would alternate. Um, and these uh, gabion cart walls would also be very much um, uh, transformable, adaptable, um, in the sense that they can be climbed. Um, so the, the, the walls itself uh, have a set of another set of affordances. They can be climbed, seated on, played with, used to store goods. Um, and that sort of existing swingable face of the shopping cart enables material to flow in and out, which enables the gaping carts to also function as a temporary material archive and deposit. The thermal inertia of construction rubble fill inspires the creation of a gabion cart trom wall system that passively heats the building and the modulation of rubble grain size and densities identifies vents within the trom wall and also enables for varied articulations of light conditions. Next slide, please. Um, oh, okay, next slide. Uh, and the ability of gabion cart wall, the, the gabion cart wall typology to grow and contract concurrent with the availability of rubble material coming from demolition works enables the typology to develop in conjunction with demolition and construction works across Edinburgh. So the gabion carts would function as a temporary deposit for construction rubble, storing it until it may be required for use within construction projects across the city. So it essentially sets up a sort of infrastructure that would revalue rubble and then make it um, available for reuse. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's me. That's you. Thank you so much, Sonakshi. And, and she's humble, but Sonakshi won the uh, RIBA Part 1 Sustainability Award that year for her project, which we were all really excited about. Uh, but over to you, Simone, to conclude. Yeah. Our... Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you again, uh, Joe and Sonakshi. Uh, so, um, Moi and I would like to end with, with a reflection or a set of provocations uh, that might... Um, be able to address, uh, we might be able to address or discuss um, further later on. Um, so the two studios we have described foreground clearly embodied materials and components, 
and the fact that the labor, carbon emissions, energy expenditure, environmental and social damage, and pollution embodied in or caused by materials, be they discarded beer cans, window frames, or floor tiles, assign them forms of value that are real and that we increasingly need to come to terms with through design methods and protocols. Um, but, but the question of value is also, we think, one that we should ask of architectural education and educators. Uh, what is it that we value? Uh, what constitutes a good design or a good building in the context of architectural education? What do we overlook to indulge our professional or disciplinary biases? And what is the definition of design these biases implicitly frame? And we've heard about it um, um, all day already. So for example, is the selection and specification of materials and components really not designed with a capital D in the way that spatial configurations may be? Are visual outputs inherently more architectural than textual ones? Is technology really separable from uh, and therefore uh, implicitly less important, less important than um, design? Are authorial intents and conceptual underpinnings with their pretty terribly narrow and myopic scope still worth discussing more than the actual effects of a project on humans and non-humans and the perpetuation of environmental and social injustices? Are they really more worthy of consideration that, for example, a building's construction ecology, to use Kilmo's term, and uh, we might think back at um, the Seagram building here that Sophie mentioned, um, more worthy of consideration than a building's operation, maintenance regimes, constructability, environmental empathy, and future adaptability. Um, and so with these questions, um, we, we will open it up and, and leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moa, Simone, uh, and students. Really wonderful design briefs and projects coming out that, and it's uh, great to say, I won't, I won't go on. Um, we'll just move straight on to Alison Robert, please. Great, thanks. Robert's just going to share Thank the screen. And Deepa. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much um, to you for inviting us to speak today. It's just been such an interesting morning, really exciting and challenging um, and inspiring. And there's just lots to think about and take home. Um, so together with my colleague Robert Whiteman and uh, Aoife Casey, a fourth year architecture student, and um, Owen Gurn, a first year architecture student, we're going to talk to you um, today about work from this year in which the four years of the undergraduate architecture studio modules work together in a vertical studio at UCD. So while we're gonna to talk today specifically about last year, we have subtitled our presentation, Work in Progress, as this work from the vertical studio is very much part of an essential shift ongoing at UCD Architecture. And I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, so next slide. So I'm gonna give you an introduction and some context for the vertical studio initiative. Robert's gonna to talk to you about the first term in which he and I work together to lead a tutorial group within the studio. And Aoife Casey, who was one of our students uh, working with us, is going to give you an insight into her work as part of this tutorial group. Then Robert's going to talk about his work as part of the vertical studio in the second term, or, or what we call spring trimester. And Owen um, is then going to talk about his work as part of that studio. So, and then I'll come back up and, and wrap up. So next slide, thanks. Um, work and response are set in relation to the climate crisis has been ongoing in UCD architecture. Um, in modules and some studio briefs in the undergraduate and then more formally in the MARC studio programme over the last number of years. Um, but we found that with the upheaval caused by remote learning and the kind of changes involved and then the return to the studios coinciding with the arrival of our new professor of architectural design, Nazreen Siraji, we came with it just an opportunity to work and respond in a completely different way. Um, so, Nazreen challenges to, to use what she saw as the collaborative strength of our studio teaching methodology to more meaningfully connect with how graduates might practice in the near future. So led by Nazreen, Professor Hugh Campbell, our head, and undergraduate studio coordinator, Michael Pike, about 250 students and about um, 30 staff, and the students are in years one to four of the undergraduate, worked as a collective to rethink reuse. So kind of the, the overall title is Rethinking Reuse on a Common Site. Um, next slide. Um, we focused all of our work on the potential reuse of one building, which is the General Post Office, or GPO on Dublin's O'Connell Street. 
So this, like um, many GPOs internationally, is at a moment of change um, where the institution is changing and the building occupants are due to move to a new um, set of um, office buildings in a new, newly developed part of the city. Um, and the future of this really significant um, public and historic building um, lies open. So next slide. So we developed the vertical studio. So the vertical studio developed over the year and over the two terms. Um, so in the first term, um, it would, at, in the first term or the autumn trimester, the emphasis was put on research. So design was held off into the latter stages. So each at the start of it, each staff member was asked to make a proposal for teaching that would encourage diverse ways of studying and understanding the building. And we each worked for the first two weeks with eight or nine students from years two to four. So in week three, the first year started college and joined us and each staff member, we were then paired with another to make a tutorial group. So that's how Robert and I um, um, linked up. So um, this tutorial group sat as one of four tutorial groups with one of four, within one of four vertical studios. So each year within that vertical studio, so first year, second year, third year, fourth year, had a lens under which they were to approach their research. Um, kind of starting with first years, looking at the anatomy of the building, kind of all the way up to fourth years, looking at the kind of wider systems and territorial connectivities. Um, so in most tutorial groups, the students worked in mixed groups to develop research and to eventually, by the end of the term from this research, to, de to develop a schematic brief and design proposal that exemplified an approach to rethinking reuse within the context of the GPO building. So all of these studios developed based on the work of the students and the design kind of really only came in at the end and it was a very schematic thing where the students developed a brief and, and an outline design. Um, so a set of common readings was circulated and the students were encouraged to develop and test all of their research through drawing. So next slide and then next slide. Um, so then in the spring term, these, this, 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 this thinking, this research and the schematic design proposals informed then the formation of four mixed um, uh, thematic vertical studios. So they were they were themed based on the research work of the term before and around structure, monument, communication, and environment. Um, so within each of these studios, um, they set up adaptable project briefs based on the schematic designs proposed at the end of the first term for the reuse of a particular part of, of our method, methodology for reusing the GPO. Um, the year groups continued working under their particular lens, increasing in, in complexity and scope. So there were 16 briefs in total across four vertical studios, ranging from something like a post office um, uh, for, for the first years, kind of a reimagined post office, to a, a data centre or, or, or examining how maybe the, the building and city centre might become or might house a data centre, among other things, for the fourth years. So all to be explored within this existing GPO building. Um, the structure of this term followed a, a more typical undergraduate studio structure that we have at EZD of developing design project, except that the years were working alongside and in some cases with each other. Um, some studios interspersed the design project workshops, Preston studies, things like that, and connections to other studios. And then we all met and spent a week in Paris just as COVID restrictions were kind of formally lifting. So I'll now pass you over to Robert, who's going to introduce in more detail the tutorial group he and I ran in the first of our autumn term. Thank you, Alice. Um, so yeah, as as Alice said, in the, in the trimester one, um, we were we were each uh, tutor was given a sort of provocation or a theme um, uh, to be to be developed in a, a brief. So uh, the green group staff, which we were part of, were asked to respond to the idea of system territorial connectivity, and that brief was to engage Dublin's general post office. Um, and so in what weeks one to three, each tutor worked with small groups of students from years two to four in vertical studios. Um, and Alice leading uh, G1 um, developed a brief that analyzed visual content in social media posts involving the GPO. And, and Alice was interested in to find out what, what this data set could tell us about a significant public building. And one that is you know, so intrinsic to the um, formation of the present Irish state. Um, and, and, and I, uh, leading G7, developed a brief kind of growing out of the idea of Delteology, which is the collection and study of picture postcards. And, and, I, and I was interested to see what, you know, how this visual aspect of the postal system that would be sent around the globe um, had established an image for the GPO. 
um, and how this related to other archival material and the kind of historical context um, of this sig significant building in the city and again, um, the formation of the Irish state. Um, and, and so the, you can see that in terms of the postcard image of it and, and, and a kind of an earlier 1916 of where it was hollowed out by, um, through the, the independence and, and also the civil war thereafter. Um, and so um, in weeks three to four, when the first, when the, the year one arrived, this kind of idea of uh, horizontality into, you know, kind of weaving in with a verticality started to take hold. Um, and these, the, the building anatomy, which was the kind of overall overarching idea for the red group, machine and function, the overarching idea for the yellow group, and publicness and urban network, the overarching idea for the blue, starts to come through. Um, for years one, two, three, and four, um, and you can see there the students that we had in our in our combined studio. Um, and so the green the green group was you know coordinated by Mar Marcus Donahue, and, and he kind of uh, was inf influential in, in how we kind of paired up. Um, uh, so Alice and I were because we were maybe talking quite visually and using that as a vehicle to explore the context. Um, we we started to. To think about what our joint studio would be and and you know charting a course for that um is sort of challenging um because we're we were developing it very much with the students with the arrival of the first years and and sort of um building um a sort of a, a sort of fractious um nature to to the to the school in a way in which the students were, were weren't very um uh, keen on the change or certain students weren't very keen on the change so we had a number of sort of workshops in which we we really um, spent a lot of time talking about what the possibilities of working in this way would be as we saw it as a studio but but also in the context of the, pro uh, the, the profession and in the context of the school um, and sometimes that that was that that was wonderful discussions and sometimes it maybe detracted a little bit um, too much from what we we might have been working on um, in terms of uh, pursuing ideas, um, in terms of you know architectural ideas or or policy ideas as well, um, and, and which we're thinking about the architecture of the profession that somehow isn't about building necessarily, or people have different skills within the profession. Anyway, um, so I mean it's it's also kind of important to note that that. Uh, Alice and I did not kind of, whilst there is this element of uh, horizontality, we didn't put too much um, emphasis on it in terms of talking with the students and pursuing their um, research ideas. So each, each student picked up a, a subject within their, their either building anatomy and machine function that then they took forward and researched. And that was the kind of only horizontality that, that we, that we uh, acknowledged. Their year was, was was immaterial um, their ideas were kind of open platform and and really uh, a, a second year would 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 be challenging a fourth year to think more um, <laughs> critically at times which was a really fruitful um, discussion to have and, and it really brought a, a great energy from some of the younger years that do come in with that kind of um, hierarchical feeling that oh I've, I've, I've just graduated from school and and now <laughs> Now I'm back at the bottom of the pecking order, which was not the case at all. Um, oh, sorry. And and so in the sort of when each of these uh, students uh, had developed uh, an idea of what they might explore and and analyze uh, in their in their kind of horizontal themes, um, we then could sort of uh, evaluated that when there was a conciseness um, and. Uh, a clarity to what they were doing and what the, how they were uh, thinking about it and, and exploring through drawing. Um, so the physical output was a drawing about an, an idea or, or, or thinking. Um, and uh, we collated them or we collected them and, and, and put them in these five groups of three and in, in which we thought that there would be a, a collect, or there could be a common ground that, uh, that they could project forward into a collect, uh, a sort of co a, a collective endeavor for their work, and these are the some of the ti the, the titles that they that these uh, pr projected projects um, resulted in. 
and we we framed it as an idea of civic generosity um, in this public building that's somehow discarded by this privatized arm of the state um, and actually it's 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 where people go to protest it's where people go to register their opinion it's not at the parliament it's at the gpo because it's so fundamental to the to the foundation of the state and and so um these the this idea of civic generosity gave a kind of an extra push with all the other kind of themes and their own driver of, of what the project could be um, and I would like to just say something about the way that we that we worked in the studio in that the, a Wednesday was an, uh, an informal um, uh, discussion with students and in their in their groups or, or, or overall in, in the studio in which um, it was a round table um, kind of chat, I suppose you would say exchange. And then that kind of became a formalized or they were to formalize some of those ideas and to really project forward or to say what they think they've achieved in that week or to say where they think they're going with their work in a formal presentation on the Friday in which we all sat around and they had a kind of uh, an audience to and it so it was this kind of um, discuss and and then and then project and, 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 and affirm what they might think and, and we invited um, uh, Mark Stoney as, as our coordinator and uh, Peter Cody as another coordinator um, to sort of input and so we had a, a variety of voices they weren't just listening <laughs> listening to our discussion points um, and uh, we also managed to sort of bring forward lectures with, with the, 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 the unpost um, uh, archivist the fantastic range of material that it, that it could talk about and, and knowledge that we could mine um, and and also Alice delivered a lot of things about um, critical writing, um, discussion, uh, workshops around these. Um, and then I, I was delivering kind of workshops ar around uh, drawing and visual communication and things like this. To, to, so at times there was not a, an, an output or not that the students were familiar with in terms of a project output. But we were really saying we've thought this what does that mean in terms of a visual output perhaps and the, the, um yeah so uh, and then here's here's as you can see here's some some examples of of, of student works produced and um the, the site plan uh, that one of the students uh, put together is very interesting in terms of um, really showing the, the GPO's position within the city, the, the old Sackville Mall that, that, that was first developed before it became O'Connell Street, which so it's like an affluent area for parading around and it's in, the, in, a, in an evening. And then it's it's north of the river, north side of the kind of uh, under, there's a north side, south side kind of divide. And Trinity, which very much kind of forms a, a, a kind of Oxford College, um, uh, as in uh, an enclosure uh, separate to the city, and 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 so the, the the sort of overall dynamic of the building in the city, and and its immediate uh, surrounds in terms of an under an under um, appreciated. Um, uh, Princess Street, which has, uh, has issues with um, drugs, but also uh, issues with. Um, uh, large kind of um, freight and such like coming in there, and then the the the, the um, Henry Street, um, which is a more commercial. So there's many faces to this building, which was which just students had to kind of find a way through to to uh, explore. And and so at this point, I'll I'll, I'll pass you over to Eva Casey, um, who will talk about her work as part of their uh, thematic group, which was waste as a commercial resource. Eva. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so I will jump right in um, and I will just start with the fact that every month Dublin City alone produces enough waste to fill the length and breadth of O'Connell Street up to the height of the GPO and approximately 80% of that ends up in landfill. So that was something I learned during the initial stage of the project where we kind of undertook this intensive research phase and then I in particular was looking at urban infrastructure and um, surrounding the GPO. Um, in particular that of kind of bins and waste management services. And I think this drawing probably speaks for what the whole project was to become, which was kind of this polemic on current cultural and societal trends of consumption. And next slide, please. So yeah, then as part of this vertical studio, I began working with two other students, one in first year and one in second year, 
and we began discussing our various researches. In the first year, Julia was looking at the facade of the GPO, and Maeve was looking at the back of the GPO and the arcade and its commercial value. And it was kind of through these conversations that we began to focus on an observation about excessive waste culture and its kind of unrealized opportunity to become a valued resource. And then we were acknowledging the kind of potential in a localized circular economy. And we kind of wanted to use commercial and civic opportunity to engage with the public world. Um, and it was kind of testing this theory in this building that became our group's approach to rethinking reuse. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and we did have the opportunity to actually visit the building, which for us was quite exciting and encouraging because the range of atmospheres that current, currently inhabit the building um, kind of motivated us that such a radical proposal could kind of place itself in such an iconic and historic building. Um, and up until this point, it was kind of developing quite abstractly, both as an idea and a concept, but we kind of, we drew like this to kind of represent our thinking. Um, and I think this was a common occurrence for me throughout the project because there was quite a lot of times where I was quite uncertain about what I was doing, but it was really through drawing and thinking and thinking is drawing that our, our project really developed. Yeah, so I think the people and the life of this idea were kind of always intrinsic to its functioning. And so we began to think about what kind of waste is entering this building and who's bringing it and how it's kind of transported internally and what it turns into. And, and it was kind of a requirement for this project that the community, there would be a lot of community participation because we were kind of seeking to rectify this kind of disconnect between um, the public and our disposal of waste that does sanction some kind of societal complacency that's destructive in a way at the moment. And um, the next slide, please. And um, yeah, and then I think we were kind of looking at this idea notionally about how things might flow through the building and um, move on these revolving tracks and be e-tagged and then kind of flow in and out of workshop spaces. And the next slide, please. Yeah, and I think up until this point, the concept had kind of been evading the building a little bit. Um, and so we then started making decisions about how and where these things would kind of uh, function um, in the building. And we wanted to completely open up the ground plane um, to the public and create this lateral movement that doesn't currently exist in the building. Uh, and in doing so, it was to become kind of a civically generous place that would also allow kind of people and process to coexist and interact at certain moments. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, so to finish up, I suppose it's probably just important to say that there is never, we were never trying to reach a specific end point with this project, uh, partially because there was always an idea that it might continue into the second semester, but also because we were kind of designing and discussing a concept or an idea as much as kind of designing a space. Um, but I think what we, what we did do was kind of adopt the GPO as a paradigm uh, for our work being this kind of government building that has it's kind of central to Irish life or has historic roots in Irish life. Um, and I think the project kind of concluded when we kind of saw the potential to expand this nationally and the kind of increasingly unoccupied post office buildings around the country and create these kind of civically open spaces in which kind of communities become linked to a process to kind of change um, or adapt cultural values. Project. Thank you, Aoife. Um, so in, in trimester two, um, as Alice uh, talked about, there was these four themes that were extrapolated from the first semester's work from across the school. Um, and they, they formed the identity of these four towers um, and each with around about sort of 60 students-ish, um, uh, uh, again, from years one to four. Um, and, and again, the, the focus was the GPO um, and where in the first semester, some uh, studios had developed off into other aspects of city and how they link into this public building. The, the second semester really, uh, what remained the focus, the GPO remained the focus of, uh, for the four towers. Um, so 
uh, I was in uh, Tower B, um, which is uh, which was Monument, and that was uh, coordinated by Peter Tansey and assisted by uh, Chris, Bo Chris Boyle. Um, and again, this idea of building anatomy, machine and function, publicness and urban network, and system and territorial connectivity uh, came through in terms of the years. But like Alice said, that the the format that that we delivered um, in the in the second trimester was a lot more uh, to type in terms of UCD, and um, there was these four briefs per year. Um, whilst we did set up vertical groups in which these years would be discussing their work next to someone that isn't doing the same project and how they're thinking, and and uh, but the the aspect of uh, how they uh, delivered a project or what they were dealing with it was a you know a brief was presided with uh, provided with a, a schedule of you know areas and all these kinds of uh, things that, that we're more familiar with um as opposed to in the first semester um and so i mean this 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 familiarity um and maybe lack of sort of fractious um discussions um, uh, whilst, you know, did give a, bring a kind of comfortableness that perhaps in the staff and, and certainly to the students, there did seem to be it's, uh, certain moments and certain key moments or, or a sort of disengagement um, between the process as opposed to what, what Alice and I had experienced in the first semester. Um, and I think that's something very interesting for us to, to, to to be actually thinking about if we're, uh, you know, thinking of an essential shift, then if this, we really we need to be engaging the, the next next generation of whatever architecture is. Um, so I mean, within within um, the studio, the first two weeks were, were were given over to this idea of monument, and 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 I think this was Robert. A, just just a slight reminder of the time. Okay, um, running right. over a bit. Thanks. Okay, right. I'll I'll quicken it up, Gillian. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I won't. I won't. I won't. Um, just to say that there was a there was a kind of a, a teaching pattern. It was a Wednesday, Friday, which was horizontal, then vertical, and that there was a, a model making process that became across the scales that became quite fundamental to how Tower B uh, functioned. And um, just to say that. Uh, Again, here's some examples of the work from, from across the studio and this idea of um, O'Connell Street. The post office uh, originally and currently is in this front part of the, uh, just through the portico in the front part of the building. And as part of the brief, which Owen is going to describe as a first year project, is a decanting um, of the post office to this under uh, uh, valued and underappreciated and kind of uh, street, uh, which is Princess Street. So it is this, this public room that is no longer in the grand space that the whole building, uh, its axis is built upon, it is to move it to the flank and how the student would adapt the existing building and engage the street with their project with a new room for the city. So at that point, I'll hand over to Owen uh, with apologies for the time. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Robert. Um, I just want to start by saying it's like a real privilege to be able to speak with uh, so many amazing minds in this talk. It's been really fascinating so far. Context in semester one, I was looking more at a city scale, and I was kind of, I think my key takeaway is that like you can rejuvenate a space through like a series of small and precise interventions. It doesn't need to be too radical. And uh, that brings me to semester two, where I was looking at monument and creating a monumental space within the GPO, which could house the function of the post office. So uh, you can see there in my map to the left that my intervention was placed about halfway down Princess Street, um, so that it could interact with both O'Connell Street being the key north south, and also through Williams Lane to Abbey Street, which is a key east-west um, route within the city. So if you could just move to the next slide there, thanks. So my project was really born out of the cross section and um, that's where I, most of my iterations to begin with came from. So there's an existing, uh, the existing structure, which consists of two columns running down the center of the wing. I found that to be a bit restricting for creating a postal hall. So 
I replaced that existing structure with a new structural arch and then um, an existing split level between the street level and uh, the ground level of about 1.4 meters. I wanted to retain that split level and try and see how I could work with it to create a dual post uh, dual teller space in which people could be served from both at, on the street and served um, through different tellers on the internal uh, postal hall at a higher level. So I had to keep catching myself uh, from working just in the two dimensions. Um, I found I kept it working just in 2D um, without thinking about how the spatial quality actually works. And that's kind of where I went with the perspective section about how the space is actually formed and articulated through uh, these structural arches. So we just need that perfect. So um, although sections, of course, are like a key part to my design, uh, so too are plants. So you can see at the ground floor, the entrance is to the east and you travel up an existing staircase into the postal hall in which there's a row of tellers to your left. And of course, accessibility is such a key factor to architecture nowadays. So there is a platform lift just to the left of the, the entrance um, with the staircase. And then you can see the row of teller spaces that operate on the outside through a, uh, a sash window form to the, uh, the public, which are outside of the thermal bridge. And then the private entrance is located on the far west of my intervention. The, uh, there's a door in to a staircase, which uh, kind of crosses up and then up to the upstairs, which is the private space where the offices are located. And like alongside a indoor outdoor space and a conference space is a row of desks, which overlook the double height uh, space, the double height postal hall. So just the next slide. Oh yeah, so um, iterative models became such a key part to our design process. Um, so I began with like a theoretical model of a infinitely long postal hall with like a variety of different arch and structural forms about how these, uh, like the weight of the building above could be held. And then from there, I kind of moved on. I discovered the split level and that's how my project came to be today, looking at scales of one to 500 and like the city scale, how it interacts with the space to 50 and about how the thresholds of the building uh, operate. So thank you. Thanks, Owen. And I'll just wrap up very quickly because I'm very conscious of everyone's time and that like the workshop after and the discussion is really is really important part. But I just want to wrap up with two key points. Um, so what we've presented here is a very simplified version of the year and it might make you think that you know, it was quite plain sailing. It really wasn't. It was very, very difficult. And, and as we all know, design is, is a messy process and the meaningful change within the parameters of an institution and with the restrictions on kind of part-time teaching co contracts and everything else, it's really, really hard. And, you know, we had a lot of friction as we tried to figure out how to work, teach and study in a completely different ways. Um, and this combined with the uncertainty of COVID restrictions expanding and contracting as we were going, we all found it really challenging, you know, students and staff. Um, but what we're finding as we reflect on the year is that within that turbulence, we have found ourselves having discussions with colleagues and with students and among students. And I think Essie kind of referenced this really well in her talk this morning, but just really got to the heart of pedagogy and the changing nature of architectural practice in just in a way that I don't, I, I haven't experienced in a really, really long time. And while the work produced and like our students are excellent and they are were a key part in the development of this project, you know, and I think I hope you got a chance to see that in Aoife and Owen's work. Um, the work is very compelling, but what I'd argue is that what the project allowed us to do is to create that was very, very valuable and to take this time and space um, to discuss and develop ideas in collaboration with students. And so in the second term, um, I, I applied for funding to become Universal Design for Learning faculty partner and director of teaching and learning, and which is in allowing us now to embed the principles of Universal Design for Learning within the development of our studios, which is just hugely important in the development of the curriculum. Because I think as one of the speakers alluded to, I think it was Sophie this morning, you know, these two things go hand in hand. Like we're not, not only connecting to the developments in architectural education in relation to the climate crisis, but also in, in relation to major societal change. And the two, the, the, the two um, need to work together. And the last point is really that what we've created, what we've presented here is very much a collaborative endeavor and it's very much a small slice of a huge collaborative endeavor, you know, amongst kind of 30 staff, 250 students. And we're gonna take time um, to reflect on it now in June. 
and then to develop plans for next year. And just in this really exciting development, which one of um, our, our colleagues from TUD um, mentioned this morning in the chat, is that we received word late this term of, of a su successful funding bid. And UCD Architecture is, is a partner in a TU Dublin um, led uh, HCI funded project entitled the Resilient Design Curriculum and in which all six schools of architecture in the Republic of Ireland are collaborating to radically revise architectural education to embed the principles of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we think that this vertical project and our learning from it will help UCD to contribute um, and develop our work as part of this project. So we'd like to invite comments, discussion, feedback, and Robert and I are going to take our, our, our learnings away from the symposium back to a retreat we're going to have in June. Um, and hopefully to lead the development or, or help the development of our work um, going forward. So thanks a million and apologies for going over time. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, Robert, and all of our speakers. Those were really interesting presentations. And I'm going to bring it right back to Felicity's talk at the start, because I think some of the things that she talk, spoke about were actually um, referenced and relevant to the, the later two talks. Um, Felicity, you spoke about um, students needing to feel at ease in order to learn and you spoke about anxious students that um, you know our architecture students tend to be anxious but you also referenced the fact that there's such a full curriculum and I and I wonder whether you know the the anxiety of the students is related to the full curriculum and coming back to what we were talking about earlier um, how do you create space for students to learn to think and to learn to talk to people you know we stuff it full of all of this stuff um, and just thinking about the the last project, um, Alison Roberts' project with all the, the vertical and the horizontal weaving and the difficulties that Alice has referenced there, I can just imagine with everything we're all trying to do to try and actually to get that to work, that's a really complex thing, but it is actually forging that critical thinking. Whereas it looks like a much more direct and possibly attainable way to structure the, the projects that Edinburgh Asala did in terms of really transforming students' perception of material sources. And I love the fact that they were really getting under the skin of an existing building, which the first years were the first years were doing at UCD. But Felicity, could could I ask you just to maybe suggest what you might leave out of the curriculum in order to relieve some of that, that anxiety and create space for more critical thinking rather than project building design? That's a really tricky one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I think what is interesting is that the ARB are moving from a criteria basis, which is that at the minute everything's prescribed, even what we teach, um, to a learning outcomes basis. And in looking at that, I think we can see if you map out how the curriculum is usually taught in, taught in schools of architecture that really design. Um, I, I would say, does design need to occupy 50% of the overall marks? That's, that's the given at the minute, right? Every course has to have at least 50% of their um, teaching um, dedicated to design. I wonder if that's necessary. I also wonder if um, the breadth of all the projects that are, are, are given are, are even necessary sometimes, you know. It may be, I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating, right? Um, but it may be that you could look at one project the whole year in its all different facets rather than trying to do three or four each time or other, other ways. I mean, I'm new to teaching professional um, studies. I used to um, direct uh, a course in uh, interior at Ravensmore called Interior design environments architecture where the whole course was about reuse adapt and reuse and that got a part one prescription and as they said later you, you do need to know the building well in order to make a meaningful um, intervention or lack of intervention to it so I mean I just think we we all kind of show off <laughs> in a funny kind of way with architecture both students and teachers and, and sometimes what we need to do is to do something really well, rather than doing lots of things not very well. I don't know if that answers it, but you know, that, that's what I think. 
Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, yes, so much food for thought, actually, because in our own practice at, at the moment, it, you know, comes to the end of term and you look at some projects and think, gosh, they could be so much better. The students need more practice at designing. And of course, this is challenging all of those thoughts. Um, we're going to have to think, cut this discussion short because we, we're sort of running out of time a little bit for the next session. Um, so unless Sophie, you want to comment on anything just at this moment in time? Just that I fully agree actually with um, with Felicity's response as well. I was just putting in the chat, my motto has always been do less, but do it better, do it well. And I think sort of repeating or taking from one year or one semester student, getting students to look at what they did in a different kind of way through different sustainability lens and then reflecting and self-critiquing is really rewarding. Some of our master's students do that, but then they go back to this earlier year and then literally say, what would I do different now that I'm two years later and I actually um, want to redesign? And then, you know, I think we always want to recreate and, and map things again, you know, as a show off. I think that Felicity refers to, we all recognize, you know, it, it, like we're almost like, each studio wants to be this all holistic encompassing course when actually it fits in five years of study that one studio doesn't have to do everything and I think we keep forgetting that that it doesn't have to do everything is this progressive learning step by step as long as at the end they can get there the biggest trick is is how do you communicate across all of the different courses and studios in those five years to make sure that then they have everything at the end that's really hard I think um but yeah and I just want to say Felicity awesome talk really amazing and everybody else as well it's really great to see the projects live coming in as well and what somebody said as well like um it doesn't mean because you're working with existing and you're not creating new there's so much creativity if anything i think with the climate emergency we need more creative thinking not less i think that's a mistake if we think that's not the case but i think it's often that we see certain doors close and we need to make different decisions that people think is being less creative is actually need to be more creative, more innovative, more experimental, more thinking outside the box. And I think for me, that's exciting. But I'll shut up because of time. But yeah, thank you. I know it's great. It's great. This is the, the valuable stuff, actually. And would any of our students, any of the student presenters actually like to give some feedback or some thoughts on what you've heard and seen today? And reference your own experience. Um, I think uh, the first year experience coming into a vertical studio, it was like, it's such a big shift from going from school into architecture college anyways, and then coming in and being surrounded by older years, it's quite a big shift. So it does take a bit of time to adjust to it. But um, I think it was really valuable. Um, I think I learned a lot more than I could have learned being just in a studio first years. I could learn from the older years. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Andy, I think I'll pass over to you then for the third session. Thanks again to our uh, speakers. That was really great, all of those talks. Thank you, everybody. Um, just let me get my notes up here. Yes, so we will still be finishing one o'clock. Oh, yes, we will. Um, but thank you for session two there. So session three is a design sprint, which is a very short five minute presentations um, from uh, some further speakers just to explore um, uh, other work being undertaken uh, in different schools, uh, some project based, some other ideas based. Uh, and then afterwards, we will come to a summing up session where we're asked um, our main speakers to try and give one main takeaway from today uh, to help us summarise and close out as we finish at one o'clock. So uh, within session three here, uh, we have Kyle Henderson, who's a final year student at the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture in Aberdeen. Uh, joining us from the Glasgow School of Art and the Macintosh School of Architecture, we have Luca Brunelli and Neil Mockery, uh, who are stage two leaders. Uh, from the University of Dundee, we have final year student Craig McCracken. And lastly, in this session, we have Andy Campbell, who is the year one lead at Strathclyde University. So Kyle, if you are okay to go first, uh, if you'd like to share a screen. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Uh, perfect, can you, uh, can you see my screen now? Um, yeah, that's all good. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, so I'll just begin with my, my five minute presentation and thank you for the invite to, uh, to come here to speak and covering the topic of low energy housing, which was for us, the master's students at the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture. It was an elective module, so we had the option to add this on, on in addition to our thesis design. So personally, it was really interesting to have this option and to choose to do so. Uh, and valuable to be taught as well by Professor Gokai Davici with such a, a wealth of knowledge upon the subject. Um, and then to begin as well, I mean, there's a lot of statistics which we know it's been going around today and it's worked well. Uh, documented. So this was in the context of building environments being um, circa 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions, the problems causing um, global warming. And moreover, developer housing within the UK typically um, dominates around 85% of UK housing stock. Um, and that was really the topic of this, um, of this module of investigation. So it's education in response to the climate emergency and looking specifically at the topic of housing. Um, the state of which housing is in and, and the theory, certainly, of housing performance. Um, this is very much the first half of this uh, elective is looking at theory of housing and then applying this uh, within practice, within um, a project, applying the end goal of the course work brief is develop a housing, but taking the design of, and almost sort of removing the design out of it and analyzing purely the performance to begin with, to understand performance and to add that to our our sort of wealth of skills is to analyze and to try and achieve low energy or net zero or better from the developer housing design. And the core themes within this module is looking towards regenerative design, so going beyond just sustainable and looking at truly regenerative, truly what is valuable to the housing industry, to the people and to the planet, and trying to achieve net zero whole life carbon. So looking at both the operational energy and the embodied carbon as well as a whole, as in a whole life carbon. And of course, imbuing the of our standards, the qualities, the qualitative aspects we can get within um, designing in this in this way. And the project was taken on um, in partnership with Barrett Homes, with the big, biggest um, property developer within uh, the UK, uh, and it was of generous um, donations from them that we had access to some of their drawings and their detail and information. And each student was therefore assigned a different a, a different type of housing typology within a typical uh, subset of housing used within Scotland and within the UK. So for myself, I was um, I was part of these students as well, and I was taking this house type here, shown on the left hand side. It was a typical family home of a two story, um, a two story design. It wasn't too uh, dissimilar to most uh, developer house type types. So it was very much a good um, benchmark to, to take it. So this is the design, and almost excluding changing the design, how can we alter the performance in certain ways? And in doing so, it, it's useful to first of all place it within a context, and we were doing this from Aberdeen. University. Um, so we're looking at Aberdeen climate set, climate data within Scotland uh, and developer housing does not necessarily advocate towards solo passive design, but uh, for the instances of this project, it was looking to assign an orientation and how does the climate relate to it. And for my part, this was the orientation I selected. So the most glazed wall uh, from thermal modeling, this was the most advantageous orientation of this design to have an 180 degrees due south um, facing entire wall. And then stripping out the design and really looking at these four this four ways of changing the performance without changing the developer design as a whole, the triple glazed windows, the bigger G values, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, airtight construction and design, and better U values, and also minimizing thermal bridges as well. So there was um, that, that's more of a footnote within this. Is it was uh, covered, but it was hard to quantify within the, the results of this work, but very much these five. Are very useful because these are also the five um, the five core principles of the path of house design um, strategies. So, how can these five affect the performance of a developer house, um, which is typically almost sometimes frowned upon within the industry of design? Um, and just changing these, how can this affect? And then through doing this, I got myself I got a few graphs, and it's a bit graph heavy. So, um, just to introduce this quickly, this is an energy balance graph. So, due to the laws of thermodynamics, energy loss equals energy gained, and the really important thing to focus on here is the largest red section, which is the specific annual heating demand. So within the passive house criteria is recommended to get this below the red line of 15, which is uh, identified on both of the graphs. And on the left hand side is what um, the actual performance was of this house type. And on the right hand side, by changing the materials, the insulation types, the natural, natural um, and the four and five principles identified above, the changes were, were dramatic and an 80% reduction in the specific annual heating demand was achievable just through changing four 
key uh, statistic given the design. And that to me was, was phenomenal, is that you can save 80% of, of, um, of the specific annual heating demand. I mean, that, that's that, that transformative for people's lifestyles. And also even the, the solar gains are from the same amount of windows it is extremely a lot bigger, 17 compared to six. And then applying this to the RBA 2030 challenge metrics, how does this affect? And this design within the de developer um, framework was identified to have um, renewables sufficient to get it into the 2025 standard as designed, but then applying this with the now lower specific annual heating demand, this would get it with a gross demand of 40, which gets into the 2025, and that could even go further into the 2030 targets. And it comes to a negative two figure for the offset demand. So technically, depending on your perspective, this could be uh, certifiably net zero operational energy. But without embodied carbon, it was um, irrelevant. So adding this to embodied carbon, this is looking at the whole life impact of the building. So embodied and operational together, how does this affect? And on the right hand side is uh, the best uh, the best case scenario as far as we we're concerned. Um, where the embodied carbon is now the biggest emitter, whereas previously the biggest emitter was operational. And that is something we'll move towards uh, over time as we reduce the operational energy and the carbon intensity of operational energy. It is embodied carbon, which will be key. But crucially within this diagram as well is the large green section sequestered carbon due to the carbon stored within the timber. So depending upon your perspective, this um, could be certifiably net zero on carbon negative design. And I think it's, it's, it's important never to ne neglect the sequestered carbon, but to be aware also of the emissions up front as well. And just relative to one another, the graphs, this is um, the size that there would be. So on the right-hand side, just by changing these four characteristics of this, this same design, I, I achieved much lower emissions to begin with, as well as much greater carbon storage. So for me, that was transformative and, and really interesting. And then finally, we briefly touched upon cost as well, because uh, there is premiums associated with passive houses and it's hard to get away from and the premiums range from 3% uh, at best case scenario I saw some excessive city living but generally between 3% to 20% typically and it's important to reference this because cost nothing is cost free and it's something that really affects the implementation of passive house design and then applying it to the investment in the operation the pros and the cons achievable and just uh, identifying this within the coursework uh, briefly <clears throat> And very, and very briefly, that came into a more fabric investment cost, but with much lower heat generator cost um, of investment. Operation was a lot lower as well, and then less to no operational cost as well, with potential for uh, for gain from donating to the grid. So um, there was those pros and cons in terms of the cost, but that was very briefly, that's my five minutes, I believe. Um, I just want to say, for me and my fellow students, it was an enlightening module. <clears throat> And learning theory and application about this was really welcomed and we really welcomed the increase of climate literate uh, learning across the sector and trying to apply this performance to influence the design further. Um, and with that, thank you very much. And I'll pass to the next speaker. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, that's great. That's super interesting because I think, you know, the developer housing is definitely something that we don't challenge enough uh, within uh, the architecture and design industry here, obviously, because they deliver the vast majority of, of housing in the UK. Uh, just put a quick link into um, some work we did in the Architecture for 2019 core program, which sought to expose the uh, National House Builders uh, model. And so thank you, Kyle. That's actually really super important. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to Luca and Neil, who are the stage two leaders at the Macintosh School of Architecture here. If you're ready to go, guys. Thank you, Andy. Yes. Um, right. Um, so before leaving the floor to the pre-recorded version of me, um, I just wanted to point out that what we present here, um, Neil and I, is a short course that runs over three weeks only and involves about 110 students. I also want to preamble that despite the focus of the exercise seems to be very much on material and embodied carbon numeracy, it is in fact inspired by um, the idea of interdependencies as put forward by Belgian philosopher Isabel Stengers. So it's in a, it's, it is an attempt, sorry. Is a collaborative <laughs> uh, it is an attempt to um, uh, design a collaborative learning experience to activate a process of uncovering the material dependencies on which the built environment has been constructed upon. 
And by asking our students to engage with the physical body of a chosen building to trigger a more critical approach on the potential interdependencies at local level, emerging from new practices or material use. Studio. Sorry. I Studio Practices is a collaborative course that for the last eight years has brought together MSA architecture students in year two and students from the shared um, program between Glasgow University and GSA um, Product Design Engineering um, in year three. The course is a valuable opportunity to share skills, knowledge and capabilities and to discover areas of practice which are outside the norms of respective disciplines. We understand that it's also an opportunity to inspire new and innovative ways of thinking and working. Keeping the project within the broader concerns for the climate emergency, this year we asked students to consider more intently the built environment as a result of the extractive practices of material and other resources from the biosphere and the geosphere. We discussed with students the benefits in reversing this trend, striving for a consistent reuse of materials and components within the anthroposphere. Mining the material stock already available in cities make possible a drastic reduction of materials and energy flows, reducing the ecological and social impact at the point of extraction. Urban mining as a practice of reusing existing buildings is a process we have now largely forgotten needed to relearn. So the three weeks short collaborative course was an opportunity to explore this theme with the students, to take a fresh look at some of these issues and challenges, and to use the course and the experience of the course as a platform from which to encourage the students to continue to experiment in the future, providing new insights and establishing innovative practices. The quest for urban mining is not just about the recovery of raw materials, it becomes also a design problem. How to reuse, re-engineer materials and components to remain in the upper echelons of the resource management hierarchy. In groups of six or seven, um, the students were asked to mine, just to analyze, measure, and visualize the material stock embedded in a single building, chosen in one of the 17 blocks along Renfrew Street in Glasgow. At this scale, um, it's reasonable to adopt what in the literature is described as a bottom-up approach, which quantifies the amount of stock piece by piece. And finally, to speculate on a prospective local reuse of the stock, what is usually referred to as the technical recoverability. The first phase of the project was a detailed analysis of the chosen building. It entailed an inventory of parts that could be reused and repurposed. As well as a thorough quantification of the material stock found in the building expressed in tons. To achieve this output, students had to use a mix of numeric and graphic tools uh, like analytical orthographic drawings, axonometrics, sketches, spreadsheet for calculation, and a range of graphs like tree maps and sunken dry diagrams. In the exploration stage, they were asked to identify at least two materials, fittings or components that were the most common and significant, both at the building scale, like for example here represented sandstone, as well as products commonly used inside the building, pipes, wiring, fixtures, etc. They had to track and illustrate the geographical location and historical conditions for the sources of these materials. In the third and last phase, they had to assess how much of all the materials and parts and fittings that they um, quantified could be potentially reused according to current practices of recycling and reuse. And finally, to speculate on improved strategy for the disassembly, reuse and recycling, focusing on strategies of circular reuse to keep materials and components in the upper echelons of the waste management pyramid. Some responses were particularly imaginative, like producing jewelry and collector's items from the depleted Macintosh building material stock left after the two fires. The main final output was an exhibition which placed again at the center the 
physical presence of the buildings. And illustrated with the range of coordinated media, the results of the analytical effort of this section and quantification and the speculative proposal of recycle and reuse. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. It was super great to see the exhibition uh, you just showed there uh, in person down in the gallery here uh, at the MSA. And uh, I think uh, from my own memories of it, which is almost only a few weeks ago, but just the, again, the tangible nature of really actually seeing the materials that you'd uh, collated and brought back into the school uh, in tandem with the wonderful models that you'd made and all the research that you'd done. I think it was a really super important project for stage two. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, we've been on to uh, Craig McCracken, who is a final year student at the University of Dundee. Craig, if you're ready to go. Yep, I'll just share my screen. Um, can you all see that? Is that, is that visible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, like uh, Andy said, I am a final year student at Dundee. Uh, I was part of the MArch and Urban Planning course. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly run through my thesis project. Uh, this year it was based in Blair Gowrie. Typically we would choose a kind of city environment, but this year we thought it would be interesting to focus on the town as with COVID and things uh, going on, the town has see been seen in this new light with people moving to it and people working from home. Um, Blair Gowrie has this uh, kind of, it's a bit of a commuter town for Perth and Dundee, so it is quite close to the university. Uh, and it has this industrial heritage of um, jute textiles uh, berries and cherries and you can see on this map on the left there's a lot of mills kind of dotted along uh, the crosses mark out where the mills are along that river down the middle that split Blair Gowrie and Rattray. So um, this project was actually part of a wider group strategy um, it was called a sewn place and we actually treated Blair Gowrie like a piece of fabric and tried to kind of repair it by uh, stopping it sprawling using things like hemming uh, hemming the edge, stitching to create connections, darning to kind of repair backlands and things like that and tie it back into the existing fabric, patching to entirely replace certain areas, and then embellishing to kind of celebrate certain areas that are underappreciated. So um, one of the topics I was really interested in was kind of physical infrastructure and um, how that can create like a resilient place and creating resilient infrastructure. But one of the things that's not kind of thought about when it comes to urban resilience is actually social infrastructure. And there's this fantastic book by Eric Klinenberg about um, the Chicago heat wave that, um, that there was certain areas in Chicago that had more deaths than others, but they couldn't work out why it was happening. It wasn't due to money. It wasn't due to kind of uh, poverty or anything like that. It was actually down to social infrastructure and uh, these places to meet and uh, have community kind of involvement. So that, uh, trying to combine these two sides of physical and social infrastructure was kind of the, the aim of my thesis. Um, and I kind of sur summarized it in this little party sketch here, which was kind of taking this contraption, in the case of Blair Gary, a mill, which creates a, a kind of object uh, or create something in this case it was tea um, which facilitates conversation and community so I called it the community cuppa contraption I used it natural materials and it was kind of just this little little um, kind of experiment party diagram and that really led uh, the brief for my my actual thesis so actually analyzing Blair Gary you can see that in the town center, I'm not sure if you can see on house, actually you can't, but uh, right in the town center, just on the left-hand side, uh, that's where most of the actual heat demand is, right in the town center, which is also the conservation area. Um, if you compare this to the poverty area, it's actually, it overlaps. The, the highest poverty is also where the highest heat demand is. And I think this is correlated just to the fact that it's a conservation area. You can't really improve the buildings. Um, by putting external insulation, double glazing, things like that. It's very difficult to get permission to do that kind of thing. So looking at legislation, it doesn't really work that way. So um, my theory was to actually create some kind of community heat and power hub that would supply um, kind of micro energy to this zone, uh, which in itself is quite controversial, um, putting a power plant um, right in the middle of the town centre and in such a beautiful area. 
uh, to supply this conservation area. So it is controversial, but being at university and being in this education environment, it actually was a really good setting to test something like this. So I also looked at kind of how, what other industries I could start to involve in this process. So I looked at brewing, I went to two local breweries here in Dundee. I also went to a bakery um, and kind of looked at the baking process and how baking and brewing kind of come together uh, in this kind of symbiotic relationship. And then the actual chosen microenergy generation style was uh, actually biomass, which has proven that people can kind of interact ar uh, around biomass plants, such as with the Copen Hill kind of experiment where they, they did the ski center on a power plant. So actually having that community factor uh, factored into it, um, biomass seemed like the best option. And when I bring these three programs together, it creates this really dense a symbiotic relationship between the three programs you can use like spent grain from the brewing to make bread and you can use old bread in the biomass process etc it's all kind of interlinked and created this really dense hybrid program um i then started looking at that social aspect and looking at how you know things like steamies um where these incredible physically functional places but also social places where people would come to meet chat uh, and this kind of thing is actually unfortunately kind of lost uh, along with other industrial heritage like this is an image of the mill which turned out to be my site that uh, mill on the left hand side there so i yeah i was looking at how we could kind of look at the massing of this old industry and then uh, kind of drawing out characteristics like um, towers and things like that, which um, kind of cemented themselves in Blair Gary and tried to make the idea of a power plant a bit less daunting right in the town center. Um, so when like, you start layering up this physical, social, uh, and like the form of it uh, in this lightweight frame, this is a kind of exploded view of everything layered up. And then when you uh, when you actually look inside, this kind of really interesting thing happens where there's industry in the background, people brewing in the front, you've got people having a drink, having a chat, this community aspect. Um, you know, you can even use the outside of the building, project onto it, you know, there's this social function as well. And um, it actually kind of starts to sit almost like an old mill, but like the form of an old mill, but it's actually this new community and physical hub for uh, the town. So that's me. I hope I didn't go over my time. <laughs> That was good. Thank you, Craig. That was super interesting. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, it's really great to actually also uh, uh, move into uh, the smaller settlements out beyond Dundee as well. Um, and thanks for uh, Sophie also posting the link to the uh, the Klingenberg book uh, for reference to that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, lastly, we have Andy Campbell, who's the stage one leader at Strathclyde University. After Andy's presented, I will invite some very short or brief reflections just on the design sprint here before we move back to Gillian for the final summing up with uh, the uh, summary from our guest speakers. So over to you, Andy. Thanks, Andy and team. Um, my name's Andy Campbell, yeah, you're one leader at Strathclyde. And yeah, apologies, we've had the external examiners in, uh, this morning, so I've actually not been able to, to tune in to, to the majority of, of this morning, but I have caught, caught snippets. Um, so if I start talking about something that's been talked about already, then apologies. I can see my colleague Hazel Wallace is on the call and one of our students from second year, Jonathan. So uh, you guys feel free to jump in and help me out if, 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 if required. Um, at Strathclyde, all of our, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, maybe not about one specific project, but just talk a little bit about the course structure um, and in particular the design studio. Uh, the design studio starts off in year one um, um, about a project about to shelter and all of our projects are based around a verb and in, in fourth year was to care. So within these kind of verb headings, um, it sets up the problem to be solved and the theme, um, but it's primarily an anthropocentric approach um, and allows students to engage with political practical issues as a way of generating solutions rather than um, been led by conventional typology or form making. Um, uh, but recently I've been tasked um, with reviewing the design studies uh, curriculum against, uh, I suppose, the, um, how we teach um, about climate emergency and biodiversity loss. So my starting point, um, which I uh, was to go to these verbs, the structure for our course and think about how we can work with that 
And adding into the mix something that I found really interesting from the 2018 Venice Biennale uh, when Grafton talked about the earth as client. So thinking about how um, these verbs become anthropocentric, but also, um, I suppose, um, placing the, the kind of ecological and anthropocentric um, as, as a kind of equal weighting in terms of, of, of how these are viewed. So this is a kind of ongoing process and something that we're talking to staff and students about. In an ongoing way. So this this five minutes or three, um, I'm going to talk about kind of how we're doing that on a macro scale from you know trying to, to you know think about the whole five years of the course, but then also just talk about some quick wins and some kind of practical things that we've done um, along the way just to, to make things happen. So uh, as a sort of um, framework, well, we're using the climate framework um, as a way of kind of um, structuring how we we. Um, uh, we review our courses and uh, uh, there's real advantages to that in terms of the headings and the, the categories and the resources that are available on the climate framework and also the fact that it's a, a kind of cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary initiative, I think, keeps it really grounded um, from a kind of practical point of view. From more of a kind of maybe um, uh, conceptual or, or sort of um, design-led Starting point. I'm kind of interested in in uh, how we uh, sort of re reposition how or re rethink how we how how we how we teach design, how we teach architecture. Um, and one of the first things that we get people to do when they come to architecture school at Strathclyde is to make a Vitruvian a Vitruvian figure of themselves. Everything starts from the body, from yourselves. Uh, we talk about your understanding of the world and your understanding of architecture. Um, and uh, and the scale of yourself in relation to the first design project. Um, I've developed this diagram that, that sort of then starts to think about a, an alternative uh, scale uh, or alternative um, uh, scale of proportions uh, based on on carbon emissions, and we're having some fun with that with students uh, um, making their own kind of measured drawings, but then starting to uh, starting to develop these kind of graphics that that. Um, instantly start to kind of place, place themselves uh, within that kind of scale. In year two, uh, we focus in the first semester on an existing building, so, you know, nothing kind of groundbreaking, but there is a real kind of deep dive into existing fabric and, um, and working with, with existing buildings. Um, in year three, uh, making real kind of progress and um, reintroducing re a kind of close relationship between technology and design studio. Um, with Laurie McElroy, they are re really doing great things in bringing kind of building physics into um, into the design course and to the um, the studio design course. Uh, in year four, um, it's a, 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 a kind of year project that looks at different scales, small, medium, large, and extra large. And uh, one of the kind of quick things we've done, uh, recent things, is add in uh, four live clients, which are either kind of social, uh, socially minded social practices in, uh, in the city or, or um, kind of um, urban kind of renewal projects that focus on climate. And then all of that kind of uh, leads up to year five, which runs um, under a theme for three years. And we're halfway through the theme of urgencies just now. And obviously the best projects then start to kind of take all those kind of aspects of, of um, uh, human and ecological kind of um, fo uh, shared focus and, and develop. And this is one of the projects I, I enjoyed the most this year, um, all about uh, sort of requarrying uh, stone in, 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 in from Scottish quarries and kind of dive into the, the material and um, qualities and, and its impact on climate and ecology. Just to finish off, um, Sonia Oliveira would like to have been here today, one of our uh, recent uh, appointments, um, a lecturer um, who runs this radical architecture practice for sustainability, which I'd just like to kind of signpost and the website, the RAPS research there, and um, you can find out more. Uh, and Sonia has um, uh, got a kind of series of events, one next Friday, I think, um, but an upcoming conference in Eindhoven uh, later in the year, um, which I think are still maybe uh, accepting uh, papers or call outs. So I uh, just like to kind of signpost that and they're doing some really great stuff in terms of um, considering buildings, the design of buildings as intertwined and entangled uh, with other species, infrastructures, 
technologies and, and systems. Um, so that's a bit of a, a kind of run through it. Sorry, probably went a wee minute or so over. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll uh, stop sharing and hand back to you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And would you mind putting the RAPS um, internet address into the chat? Thank sure. You. I sound yeah. like an old man, internet address, yeah. website. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, very briefly, uh, just we'd like just to open it back up for any comments or thoughts from the uh, design sprint, if anybody would like to reflect. It was good to see in the chat there's some affinity between the stage two work and the, the fourth year work uh, between MSA and Asala uh, with Lucas, Simone and Mo. I think there is uh, some wonderful affinities through the, the lenses that you're looking at and the work there. Um, so that'd be great as in the chat if you want to meet up. Okay, well, I think we're, we've got literally oh, sorry, two minutes. Sorry, um, Gillian, just Alice has her hand up. One second. Oh, great, sorry. Alice. Just, just to say, it's just so great to see all of these examples and kind of different people working in different ways across, like in the design for sprints and, and across the day. And I'm really wondering, like, could, and maybe you already have plans for this but like could this be something that repeats because it's just such a valuable experience like each of those four presentations just now I, you know just thinking about them and kind of going oh we could do this we could try that you know it's just so great to hear this this stuff um so i just was w wondering about that and just put that out there well we kind of hope it might yeah, might turn into something that was more regular because the zoom of course and either we're also used to it but it makes all of this so much more easy yeah i find it great as an annual thing, just as a get together and a celebration at the end of the year, just to catch up and see what everybody else is doing. Because I think that's the thing about isolation that, that we we need to get more connected. This but collaboration and democratic processes that you know we can share each other's ideas and be inspired by each other, which I think is, this has been a great platform. Yeah, I think it's great to have the schools and the students talk to each other more because obviously, uh, you know, in, in a Scottish context, the heads of schools talk to each other, but it's actually very difficult for, for staff uh, within schools, but also between the schools to understand who's doing what. And I think overall, obviously, we're all acutely aware of the challenges that we face, but actually sharing inspiring and progressive work is actually super important uh, to keep us all going, but also to learn from each other. So it's been a really great morning. So thank you to the design sprinters there. And um, I'll now hand you back uh, to Gillian, who will uh, take us through some final reflections well, and we'll close this out. Yeah, um, just on that last point, I'm going back to Felicity's comment where she made uh, the point that marginal change cannot lead to systemic um, systemic can't address systemic failures and just that point about all of us being able to talk to each other because sometimes you feel that you're trying to do something it feels a little bit out there but actually you know it's not everybody is trying to do um to change things significantly and make and make progress uh, and really change the education of our students so last one minute um could i invite sophie and felicity perhaps if you'd like to just Give us one comment reflection back and and before that just thank you to everybody for presenting and coming along and and putting the effort in to make those wonderful presentations it's, it's just been really great thank you very much sophie felicity would you like to just uh, oh yeah one comment i don't know felicity what would that be um i just think that um it comes back to this we can't think around the edges the marginal change isn't enough i think we need to do this together not just in these spaces but like really discussing together and um go outside your comfort zone is uncomfortable but do it anyway do it anyway and it's so rewarding and i think what i think i'd also took away today from seeing the student and teacher projects and also put it in the chat is that people have been going outside their comfort zone and actually they're no longer uncomfortable. That's always the, what you learn from it. It feels hard and it feels uncomfortable, but then you realize actually this feels great that you're part of this change. And I think that also tackles this anxiety and this, you know, when you feel you're acting, it tackles the anxiety we have around the climate and not knowing what to do when we're part of that change. So do it anyway. That's the best I can, I can do for you. <laughs> great advice. Um, and I think I, I just um, welcome the platform. And in a way, this is how we should be teaching, right? We should all be in a room talking to our students and not at our students and allow this sort of possibilities and find a way of getting real discussion and also talking about our own interests and their interests and finding this idea of co-creation. Yeah, 
if we can. Great. Um, thank you. So from the three of us, Cathy, Andy and myself, thank you very much again for presenting and attending and contributing to the mural board and the chat. And a final thank you to Scott Sutherland School at RGU for funding the event. And hopefully maybe we can do it all again next year. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Feel Thank free you. to get in touch. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.